It's very firm. I'm going to stare like back into the camera and I'll say, what do you think, Becca? <laughs> and then she'll answer it very well. I'll be like, that. <laughs> there you go. Um, but Becca helps lead the program. So some of you have had her all bit in classes in the MACCS. So it's good to have you here. Thanks for being here. Um, Let's begin with a, a prayer, and uh, then we'll uh, kind of circle back to something that one of our students, Kathy, who's appearing um, on the live stream from Virginia, uh, mentioned to us uh, last night. I thought it would show us one little passage that comes from Homer's Odyssey, a book that wasn't assigned to you, but it's just one little uh, delightful passage that Kathy mentioned to us that I think we can take a look at real quick before we dive into uh, the Aeneid. So let's pray, and then we'll get going. Our Father, we thank you for this class, for these students, for their diligence in uh, doing these readings and coming to class prepared to talk about these, these wonderful topics. We, we thank you for the truth that we find in these texts. We thank you for Christ and all he is to us. We ask you to be with us today, guide our thoughts and our conversations for Jesus' sake. Amen. So. Um, Last night, uh, Kathy, when uh, she was uh, uh, making a few comments for us about Homer, uh, pointed our attention to book eight of the Odyssey. And one um, a delightful little passage that I'll read for you. You are not gonna have it in front of you and that's okay. Uh, but um, let's, let's uh, look at book eight uh, together and see if uh, this sounds like Homer to you. Um, in, this, in this particular passage, Odysseus has uh, landed on an island as part of his journeys back to Ithaca. He's spending 10 years getting home, and uh, he has landed on an island of a group called the Phaeacians. And as is usual, they invite him for dinner. He has dinner, and then they bring out the singer, the bard. Um, let's see if this sounds familiar to you. Let none refuse the summon also to the inspired singer Demodocus, for to him the god gave songs surpassing in power to please whenever the spirit moves him to singing. So he spoke and led the way, and the others followed said separate kings, but the herald went seeking the inspired singer, and also the 52 young men who had been selected went, as he told them, along the beach of the barren salt sea. But when they had come down to the sea and where the ship was, they dragged the black ship down to the deeper parts of the water, and in the black hole set the mast in place, and set sails, and made the oars fast in the leather slings of the oarlocks. The herald came near, I'm skipping down a little bit, bringing with him the excellent singer whom the muse had loved greatly and gave him both good and evil. She reft him of his eyes, but she gave him the sweet singing art. Pontanoas set a silver studded chair out for him in the middle of the feasters, propping it against a tall column, and the herald hung the clear lyre on a peg placed over his head and showed him how to reach up with his hands and take it down and set beside him a table and a fine basket, and beside him a cup to drink whenever his spirit desired it. They put forth their hands to the good things that lay ready before them, but when they had put away their desire for eating and drinking, the muse stirred the singer to sing the famous actions of men on that venture, whose fame goes up into the wide heaven, the quarrel between Odysseus and Peleus' son Achilles, how these ones contended at the gods' generous festival with words of violence, so that the lord of men, Agamemnon, was happy in his heart that the best of the Achaeans were quarreling. These things, skipping down, the famous singer sang for them. But Odysseus, taking in his ponderous hands the great mantle dyed in sea purple, drew it over his head and veiled his fine features, shamed for tears running down his face. That's probably Homer talking about himself. Okay, that's speculative. Uh, but the blind singer, uh, the one who brings tears to the face of those who hear about the sufferings of the Trojans and the Greeks. Um, thank you again, Kathy, for uh, mentioning that passage to us. It's a, it's a delightful little passage and a little hint into uh, perhaps Homer telling us a little bit about himself. Um, we have up here uh, to start our discussion of the Aeneid, a sculpture, a Bernini sculpture. Anybody recognize it? This is a scene from the Aeneid, a scene you read. I'll give you a minute. There are three characters. So we've got powerful Aeneas, kind of there in the middle, with his aged father, Anchises, up on his shoulder. 
and then little Eulis, his son, down beside him. Okay? It's one of the most famous scenes from the Aeneid. Uh, when Aeneas, to show his pietas, which we'll talk about this morning, his piety, uh, leaves the city of Troy and takes with him his aged father and takes with him his little son. Now we'll talk about it. And of course, fathers and sons figure prominently in the other epic we read yesterday, the Iliad, right? Um, but this is very symbolic. A father, his son, and then a grandson. Okay, so what, what do you think that's symbolizing? I mean, you can, you can do all sorts of things with that, but I mean, the most basic, what do you think? What do you think, Sam? Yeah, there's a, there's a sense in which it's almost like uh, past, present, and future, yeah. isn't there? I mean, the, the, uh, this, is, this kind of scene shows up in paintings all the time. There was a, a beautiful painting in the National Gallery in Scotland, right across from where I got the, the PhD, and I used to go and stand and look at it, you know, and it's a, a painting of an old man in the background, a young man in the foreground, and then a baby off to the side, you know? That kind of uh, past, present, and future symbolism is very powerful. Um, it's especially powerful to me as I get closer and closer to being the old man in the <laughs> sculpture. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when I can ask my son Andrew to kind of hoist me up onto <laughs> his shoulders and carry me around. Uh, he's five now, almost five, so I think it would probably break his back if I tried to do that now, but hopefully one day he can carry me on his shoulders like this. Um, but as you get a little bit older and as you associate a little bit more with the aged Anchises and a little bit less with uh, Aeneas, uh, it becomes more and more of a powerful uh, image for us. Um, I think of this every time my back hurts when I do a task that, you know, five years ago wouldn't have caused me any trouble. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm getting to be more of Anchises than Aeneas. Um, do you think it represents, like, immortality? Uh, maybe. Immortality of a sort. Uh, yeah. Yeah, immortality in the sense that the line is continuing. Yeah. Um, and we'll see the significance of baby Eulis, Harvest Eulis, little Eulis. Um, of course, because he's going to figure prominently in the prophecy of what is to come. Okay? Why, why is this, this young, young boy so important? <coughs> we'll see that. What did you guys think of the Aeneid? I'm lost. <laughs> You're lost? Okay. I really am. All right. That's fair. Yeah. I, uh, I just don't know these characters, you know. Yep. Just, it's all very new to me. Me and Abe were talking about it. It's quite like mm -hmm. some people who are, we didn't grow up with the Bible. Yeah. You know, just... A lot of this stuff is just so new. You just yep. feel so like your world is the, the gaps are so big. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah. It's definitely. It's almost you can tell he's working with the Iliad. In oh the yeah. Background. Oh yeah. You just can't ignore the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yeah. yeah. And we yeah. haven't and read the Odyssey in yeah, this class, but both. Cyclops and mm -hmm. this thing. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. He's taking that. He's kind of like fixing it, and not fixing it, but working mm -hmm. it for his own purpose. I'll show you some passages in the Aeneid where I'm pretty sure that Virgil was thinking, huh, I, I one-upped Homer here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think there are points where he's, he's kind of saying, like, yeah, you couldn't have done that well. Look at that. Look at that simile. I'll show you a couple similes that are, that are uh, pretty, pretty magnificent. Um, but it is kind of like entering into a conversation in the middle, isn't it? I mean, it, there, there's an assumption of a lot of things that he's making that I think the first time you encounter it, it feels pretty foreign. Um, Does this one contain a prophecy? driven by a prophecy versus the other being somewhat historic, so to speak, and so this one, I mean. Depending on what you mean by history, yes. Um, the Iliad has a lot to do with, you know, what's the origin of this, this feud between the, the East and the West, between the Greeks and the Trojans, you know, what kind of uh, characteristics do the Greeks have, what kind of characteristics do the Trojans have, that sort of thing. This has a prophecy right smack dab in the middle of it that says this is what the Romans are going to be. Um, there's also a premonition of the goddess that we'll talk about, about the destruction of her favorite city, Carthage, which drives a lot of the action. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the names of gods and goddesses are a little bit different in this, aren't they? So did that throw you off at first? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you got who the heck is Juno? Yeah. <laughs> right. um, my, uh, my wife and I, for our very first pet, got a, a, a little guinea pig, was my idea, it was my wife's idea. And uh, of course, I had, um, 
prerogative to name it because I was opposed to getting it. So I said, well, if nothing else I need to name it. So I named it Juno, you know, the, the Roman goddess. Uh, Juno had all sorts of health issues. I actually left a wrongful death deposition down in Miami uh, to go to the hospital to be with Juno, our guinea pig. Uh, it's, it's kind of an awkward you know, thing to have to announce, like I've got a family issue, you know, it's an emergency, there's a hospital involved, you know? I just didn't say it was for a guinea pig. Um, but Juno is one of the names of the goddesses, okay? Um, think of some other names, Jupiter, it sounds a little bit different. Um, this is speculative, but it's possible that, that the name Jupiter is nothing other than Zeus Pater. Yeah. Okay, so Father Zeus. Um, the Romans seems, seem to have adapted Greek uh, gods and goddesses uh, to, to some extent. They're not exactly the same. You can't just line up Jupiter on top of Zeus and act like they're exactly the same, but they're very similar. Okay. Um, same with a goddess like Juno. Who, who is jo Juno close to in terms of Greek goddesses? Is it Hera? Yeah, Hera. Okay, the sister slash wife of Zeus. Right? Um, if you're interested, uh, there's a, a book, and it's technically a children's book, but it's uh, Dallaire's uh, Book of Greek Myths. Do you like this? Yeah. I mean, I, it's a children's book. I enjoy reading it. So Thanks. Becca would recommend it, too. Okay. Um, it's illustrated. It gives you a condensed summary of each of the Greek gods and goddesses and the major stories around them. Because, of course, one of the problems with uh, Greek and then Roman mythology is these things tend to change over time. You know, you need the story to go a certain direction, so you tell it one way, and then somebody else tells it a slightly different way. Um, maybe it's important in one story for Hera to be Zeus's sister, and another story it's important for her to be his wife. You see what I mean? So, uh, Delaire's, I think, does a really nice job of kind of condensing it. So if you're, if you're interested, I can show you at the break a copy of the book. I have it in my office, um, and that might be helpful, both for this, this class, but just going forward. What was it called again? Delaire's, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the book. Um, uh, and it's book, Delaire's Book of Greek Mass, but it might be helpful. It's, if you can get past the fact that it's supposed to be a children's book uh, and you realize, well, I actually don't know a lot of this stuff, which is true for me the first time I read it, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate it, I think. Uh, it's really well illustrated from what I remember, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so part of the, the foreignness of the Aeneid when you first encounter it is just, there's a difference in terms of the names of God and go gods and goddesses, which, you know, you've just gotten used to the Greek names. Now we've We've got the Roman ones. Um, it's also going to strike you a little bit odd at first because part of what um, Virgil, the author of this, is doing is he's rewriting not just the Iliad, but he's rewriting the Odyssey. And we've, by necessity, kind of skipped over the Odyssey a little bit because I didn't want to give you too much Homer. Um, you can also be thankful to Becca for that. That was her suggestion. So those of you who were exhausted yesterday, that was Becca's very good suggestion. Um, but you, you should know that essentially the first half of the Aeneid is largely mirroring the journeys of Odysseus home in the Odyssey. The second half is largely mirroring the story of the Iliad. Okay? So if you think of the, the uh, Greeks having a two-part Bible essentially, the Iliad and the Odyssey, okay? book one, book two, what Virgil, the author of this, and we'll talk a little bit about Virgil, what he's doing to some extent is switching those and putting the Odyssey first and the Iliad later, okay? It's not a direct one-to-one -one comparison, but they're very similar, okay? So who was Virgil? Poet. Yeah, he's a poet uh, living in the first century before Christ. Uh, his dates are 70 to 19 BC, memory serves, so 70 to 19. Now, if you have dates uh, from 70 to 19 uh, BC, one of the things that that means that's really important is he's living and writing after 31 BC. Anybody know why 31 BC is really significant? Go for it. Who gets the power? Um, Augustus, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So 31 BC is a critical date in uh, Roman history because it's the Battle of Actium. Um, the Battle of Actium is the battle where Caesar Augustus and his soldiers and his navy defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra and their navy. 31 BC is a really, really important date in Roman history. 
Um, why? There was like a civil war. Yes. And there was Octavian or is yes. it Augustus. It goes on to be Augustus. Okay. Yeah, and by then, that title. Yeah. So I mean, there was a huge civil war, and mm -hmm. then, um, and then uh, uh, Octavian yeah. comes back to. I don't know. It, there's peace. Yeah. And I, restores peace to Rome. 31 BC marks a turning point in Roman history because there's been about a century of constant civil war between different factions in Rome. Um, think here of uh, about a decade before this, a little bit more than a decade before this, when Julius Caesar uh, crosses the Rubicon uh, with the statement, alia yacta est, the die is cast. That's the first Latin phrase my, my little boy Andrew learned, alia yacta est, he, he loves yelling it, okay, alia yacta est, the die is cast, but you know the story, he crosses the Rubicon, he starts marching towards Rome, and he's essentially made a dictator, okay, all sorts of people are being killed, people are being displaced, um, the, the Roman orator Cicero uh, is killed during one of these, these periods, uh, it's pretty, pretty brutal, they uh, chop off his head, and chop off his hands, um, he had written and spoken against certain people who were very powerful, uh, they actually nail his head to a door in the forum and, and a woman who particularly hated him comes up and stabs his tongue with her, one of her pins. Okay? How dare you speak against someone I like. Uh, this is a brutal period. 31 BC marks a turning point. Okay? The Battle of Actium marks a turning point. And what we have after 31 BC is a period that is often referred to as the Pax Romana. Okay, the Peace of Rome. It is a period in which there is one ruler of Rome, Octavian, who will go on to be known as Augustus. Okay? It's, it's a term of, of uh, power, Augustus. Um, but Octavian is, is clever, and so he tells everyone not to call him an emperor, not to call him a king. Romans don't really like kings. Anybody remember why Romans don't like kings? It's because uh, many, many centuries before, there had been a king named Tarquin, Tarquinus Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. And Tarquin had raped a woman named Lucretia. He thought he could get away with anything. Lucretia makes a very dramatic uh, uh, profession of what had happened and then kills herself. And this uh, results in Tarquin being expelled from Rome. And Romans decide, we will never have a king again. Okay? We'll never have their word for it as a tyrant. Now, Caesar, uh, 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 Octavian is intelligent, so he, he decides not to style himself as a rex or a tyrannus, a, a king of some kind. So he says, you just call me princeps, okay? Kind of like citizen, okay? First citizen, okay? Think of uh, George Orwell Animal Farm, right? Um, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others, okay? Here is Octavian, who's a citizen, just like everyone else, except not, <laughs> okay? He's very clever about posturing himself as, I'm just a regular schmo, right? I'm just one of you. Now, don't write against me, or you may end up banished, <laughs> or possibly executed, right? But I'm just one of you, I'm a princeps. Um, 31 BC is really important because it's smack dab in the middle of uh, this character, Virgil's life. Virgil, prior to um, uh, Octavian taking power, had spent a lot of his time writing um, bucolic uh, poems. Okay? This is what I would do if I weren't employed by Knox. Uh, I would sit in my house and I would write poems about gardening. Okay? Um, there's a famous story about a Roman uh, emperor who leaves being an emperor. He leaves the position of emperor. His name is Diocletian. And he goes off and he farms. And he writes about it. And one of his friends writes him and says, don't you want to come back as emperor? And he says, if you could see my zucchinis, you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> okay? that's, what, that's what Virgil is doing. Okay? He's off on his farm writing this bucolic poetry, okay? sometimes called eclogues or georgics. Um, they are poems about farm life, okay? things the way that they should be in a proper Roman uh, man's life. You know, you've got your farm. It's being cultivated by your slaves. But you can walk out and sort of like taste grapes from the vineyard, you know? I mean, this is, I've long told people that I wanted to have a vineyard, and they always start telling me how difficult it'd be to grow one. I'm like, I don't want to grow one, I just want to have one. You know, you can kind of walk through it. That's, that's what Virgil is writing about, okay? That kind of bucolic lifestyle, that, that calm, peaceful type of life. 
Now, for much of his life, Rome is being torn apart by civil war. That doesn't fit with farm life. Uh, we think that uh, at one point, at least during one of the civil wars, he may have been dispossessed of his property. Not a, not a great thing for someone who thinks that, that farm life is the best life that there is. Um, so at some point, uh, Virgil begins to write a story about the Roman foundation, okay, the founding myth of Rome. And he wants to tell Romans where they came from and where they're going. Now, any ideas what the culmination of Roman uh, glory will be? I mean, when we get to the point where we know we are where we were supposed to be, it will be in the reign of Caesar Augustus, okay, in the reign of this princeps, uh, this man who has brought the Pax Romana. Now, there's some debate as to exactly how inspired to write this uh, Virgil was by Octavian Augustus. Uh, was he paid to do it? We're not sure. Uh, but we do know that he actually died before he had finished it. You, you saw this, right? Um, he died before he had finished it, and he wanted it to be burned. Okay, some of you are probably wishing he had. <laughs> he would have just gone on to Baal. <laughs> Dang it, it was so close. Um, no. Uh, Caesar Augustus insisted that it be preserved and that it be published, which at that time just meant copied. Okay? Because Caesar Augustus really liked it. So we don't know exactly what their personal relationship was, but we know that he seems to have written his work to talk about where Rome came from and where Rome is going. Now he has a, a view of history that's very similar to like an 18th century German. You read an 18th century German, you know, all of human history is all of us trying to be German, right? And by the end of the 18th century, some of us have been. <laughs> and this is the kind of the goal of everything. Uh, Virgil thinks of history that way, especially when it comes to Rome. Rome has been working towards this point when it will become, uh, uh, you know, when things will become the way that they're supposed to be. The Pax Romana, when things are the way they're supposed to be, under a ruler who's put an end to civil war. Thoughts on any of that? Comments? We're going to dive into the text here in a second. Um, but 31 BC and the Battle of Actium, really, really important date for someone like Virgil. It's really important for, for Roman history as well. Okay? All right, let's look at the text. So go ahead and take out your copy of the Aeneid if you have it. Hopefully you have the, the Fitzgerald translation, yes? Okay. Um, let's turn to book one. And we're gonna see something that's probably going to um, remind you of the opening line of the, the Iliad. Recall that the Iliad uh, opens in Greek with menin, aeda, thea, peleidio, achilleos, okay? Menin, so rage, um, and an invocation of a muse, seeing the muse. Well, here we begin with arma verum cretano, um, a passage, this, this opening line, I teach Latin for high schoolers, and this opening uh, paragraph here is often translated. Uh, they're often very distressed when I assign it. <laughs> like, no, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna translate this. And about six lines in, they're like, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> but, arma verum quecanda. So, I sing of warfare and a man of war, or a man at war. From the sea coast of Troy in early days, he came to Italy by destiny. To our Lavinian western shore, a fugitive, this captain buffeted, cruelly on land as on sea, by blows from powers of the air. Behind them, baleful Juno in her sleepless rage, and cruel losses were his lot in war till he could found a city and bring home his gods to Latium, land of the Latin race, the Alban lords and the high walls of Rome. Tell me the causes now, O muse, how galled in her divine pride and how sore at heart from her old wound the queen of gods compelled him, a man apart, devoted to his mission to undergo so many perilous days and enter on so many trials. Okay, we'll keep reading in a minute, but uh, you notice a few things there. Um, the opening line tells you what this is going to be about. We said that the Iliad is about rage. It's about Manon. It's about uh, the rage of Achilles and how that kind of shapes the whole work. Um, Virgil here is going to tell us what his work is about. He's singing about warfare and a man at war. But there's a convention to this, isn't there? You have to invoke the muse. We talked about epics, especially classic epics. Uh, being uh, uh, works that begin with an invocation of the muse, and you see that um, in line 13 here. Tell me the causes now, O muse, 
how galled in her divine pride and how sore at heart from her old wound the queen of gods compelled him. So Virgil is, is mimicking Homer. He's, he's following the patterns that have been established for him in terms of this uh, style of literature. Um, and he's doing the things that you're supposed to do. So he tells you what the work is going to be about. Um, and he tells you that he is invoking the muse in doing that. Um, please. What is the muse? It is a goddess of song and poetry and um, literature, basically. So you're, you're asking for the goddess essentially to speak through you, if that makes sense. When, when, when the bard is singing, um, when, when Homer gets up at the end of, of a feast, for instance, and they put away the desire for food and drink, and he sings of the man of many ways, Odysseus, or he sings of the rage of Achilles, or what have you, he invokes the muse so that this, this song, this story, is being told by him, but it's kind of coming through, coming from a goddess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I hear it all the time, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yep. Um, the Dallaire's book will have more about the muses, actually, so I'll, I'll bring that at the, the break. It might be helpful to, to look at that. But uh, in essence, it's a goddess of, of song, of story, of literature. Um, and you can't tell this alone, right? I mean, this is one of the things that we talked about when we talked about epic yesterday as a genre is you have these, these cosmic stakes involved, and the gods and goddesses are often directly involved, sometimes in the deus ex machina, right, where they kind of swoop in. But this is a story that really, really has cosmic implications. Um, so you don't just want to. This isn't. This isn't telling your friend about how you killed a boar yesterday. You know, this is a, this is a story about the, the the history of your people. You know, you want a god on your side telling you telling that too. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, good question, by the way. Um, in her divine pride and how sore at heart from her old wound, the queen of gods compelled him, a man apart devoted to his mission to undergo so many perilous days and enter on so many trials. Who is the queen of the gods? Who's compelling him? Let's keep reading. Can anger black as this prey on the mind of heaven? Tyrian setters in that ancient uh, time held Carthage on the far shore of the sea, set against Italy and Tiber's mouth a rich new town, warlike and trained for war. And Juno, there you go, we are told, cared more for Carthage than for any walled city of the earth, more than for Samos even. There her armor and chariot were kept and, fate permitting, Carthage would be the ruler of the world. So she intended and so nursed that power, but she had heard long since that generations born of Trojan blood would one day overthrow her Tyrian walls. And from that blood, a race would come in time with ample kingdoms, arrogant in war for Libya's ruin. So the park high spun. Okay, um, Juno, the queen of the gods, uh, uh, similar to Hera, okay, the, the, the sister of uh, Zeus, uh, loves a particular city. She loves a city that is on the North African coast, the city of Carthage. And she knows, or she suspects strongly, that there's coming a time when that city is gonna be destroyed. By whom? Who's going to destroy Carthage? Uh, not Aeneas, personally, um, uh, unless you think that him leaving Dido is destroying it. But uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, his race, the Romans. There are going to be three wars that are going to be fought called the Punic Wars. Okay? You heard of the, the, the Punic Wars? There are three, three Punic Wars. Okay. Um, Punic uh, has as its, as its uh, root the word Punis, which is a, a word for Carthage. Three wars that are fought, three Punic wars that are fought against Carthage, um, in, uh, culminating in the final war, which happens, ends about 100 years before the Battle of Actium. Okay. Now, you know some of the characters in the Punic Wars. You've heard some of these stories. You've heard the Latin phrase, Hannibal ad portus, okay? The, 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 you guys took Latin, so you memorized that, right? It was probably one of the first phrases you memorized, Hannibal ad portus. Hannibal is at the gates, okay? Uh, Latin has a tendency to leave out the verb, so Hannibal at gates. Um, 
It's supposedly the, the uh, phrase that is used by every uh, Roman mother to scare her child to go to sleep. Uh, ancient people had this odd tendency to think that the way to get your kid to go to sleep is to scare the daylight out of them. <laughs> it doesn't work for what it's worth. Um, uh, Hannibal ad portas, Hannibal is at the gates. It's, it's uh, said during a period when Hannibal, a Carthaginian, holds hate in his heart for Rome. And he and his Carthaginian soldiers actually cross the Alps with elephants, by the way, which has intrigued a lot of people exactly how he got those elephants over there. Uh, they seem to have used some sort of combination of vinegar and something else to blast away uh, rocks that were in their way. It's pretty remarkable. Um, but Hannibal uh, had a father who fought against the Carthaginians in the First Punic War. Uh, the, the Carthaginians and the Romans are going to be uh, uh, rivals for the, the uh, Mediterranean Ocean. And so they're going to fight a number of battles. Hannibal's father was named Hamilcar Barca, and Hamilcar Barca in the Latin, held hate in his heart for Rome. And he hated Rome his whole life, and he fought against Rome, and he lost. And so when he had a boy, he took his boy Hannibal, and he took his boy to the altar, and he put his boy's hand on the altar, and he said, always hold hate in your heart for Rome. Swear that you will always do so. And Hannibal did. And Hannibal, for his entire life, fought the Romans as well in a period called the Second Punic War. Um, he is probably the only person in Roman history to repeatedly defeat Roman legions in pitched battles. Uh, one battle, the Battle of Cannae, uh, resulted in more than 40,000 Romans just being slaughtered by Hannibal's troops. Okay? Um, but uh, his city doesn't ultimately support him, and he is eventually defeated by the Romans. Um, the final uh, Punic, uh, Punic War is kind of a sad one. And it ends in the Romans uh, utterly destroying the city of Carthage. There's a legend about it that the Romans hated Carthage so much by that point that when they destroy, destroyed Carthage, they actually sowed the, the fields with salt. Now, they didn't. We don't think they actually did that. But there's a legend about that to show how much they hated uh, the city of Carthage. So the Aeneid is going to be driven by events that took place at least 100 years before it's written, but hundreds and hundreds of years after it's set. Okay? Now, this is a little complicated, so let me show you kind of a line here. If we've got, um, if we've got uh, Virgil, who dies in, you know, say 19 BC, Okay, so we'll put that as the, the kind of end state for the Aeneid. We've got the uh, Punic Wars, which take place here, three Punic Wars, you know, in the um, say third and, and uh, yeah, third and uh, second centuries uh, BC. So we'll just use round numbers. This is not an exact number, uh, but 300 to 150 BC, again, very round numbers. Um, and then we've got the story of Aeneas, all right, and let's say this is around 1200 BC. So the action of the Aeneid, as we're going to see, is going to be driven by the fact that Aeneas is trying to travel home, he's trying to travel to uh, uh, his new home of Rome, found Rome, and yet the goddess who loves Carthage, knows that this war, or these wars, are going to be fought. And at the end of those wars, Rome is going to destroy the city of Carthage. All of it is written by Virgil many years later. Okay, so you, you see multiple layers of this, right? Virgil is talking about events that took place 1,200 years before. And in that period, in those, those, uh, that time of you know, Aeneas and, and all of these happenings of the Aeneid, everybody's predicting something that's going to happen many, many hundreds of years later. Now, Virgil knows that that happened. Okay? All of Virgil's audience knows that that happened. So similar to uh, Homer when he writes the, the Iliad, Virgil is not setting out to kind of surprise people. Okay? Nobody who's reading Virgil is going to be like, oh my gosh, the, the Carthaginians are going to fight the Romans in three wars? <laughs> really? There, there's none of that. Okay, everybody knows that that's going to happen. That is clear to everyone reading Virgil. But like Homer, 
What Virgil is doing is telling you how they got there in a really fascinating, carefully crafted way. Does that make sense? Let's pause for a minute. Anytime you put a graph up on a, a board, it, it has a potential to cause confusion. Does this make sense? Okay, all right. So we've got the events that Virgil's talking about. We've got the events that are predicted in Virgil, and then we got Virgil, okay? That's kind of the, the key idea. And these are very round numbers. Don't, don't write down the, the dates that I'm giving you uh, as if they're, they're facts. You will fail a, a Latin history exam with those dates. All right, um, let's, uh, let's keep reading in the opening uh, paragraphs. Uh, Juno, we are told, so line 24, cared more for Carthage than for any walled city of the earth, more than for Samos even. There her armor and chariot were kept, and fate permitting Carthage would be the ruler of the world. So one of the driving factors of the Aeneid is going to be the fact that Juno loves Carthage and is going to be able to, to kind of intuit or prophesy that it is going to be Rome who will destroy Carthage, and therefore Aeneas must be kept off his course. Okay, He must be persuaded to stay away from founding Rome. Now, what you're missing here that I have to tell you about is that much of the Odyssey is actually driven by a similar tension in which Neptune, the god of the sea, is furious with Odysseus. And he's constantly trying to keep Odysseus from getting home. Why? Because Odysseus was very impolite, and when he stayed with the Cyclops, he put out the Cyclops' eye. Right? Now, Odysseus' case was that the Cyclops was trying to eat him, but, you know, what's that between friends? Um, in essence, Neptune is keeping Odysseus from getting home, and when Virgil sets out to write the Aeneid, he's going to write a story about Juno trying to keep Aeneas from getting home. Does that make sense, the correspondence? Okay. Uh, she had heard long since that generations born of Trojan blood would one day overthrow her Tyrian walls, and that from that race, a race would come in time with ample kingdoms, arrogant in war for Libya's ruin. Now here, your Roman listener kind of perks up, says, oh, that's us, right? This is Cato the Elder during the, the uh, Punic Wars who always ended his speeches, Cartago delenda est, Carthage must be destroyed, okay? And another thing, Cartago delenda est. I would love a politician to do that just... Even as a joke, that would be great. A Donald Trump speech, if it ended with Cartago Delenda S, wouldn't that be awesome? You'd know somebody was writing his speeches and knew this. Uh, in fear of this, and holding in memory the old war she carried on at Troy for Argos's sake, the origins of that anger, that suffering, still rankled deep within her. Hidden away, the judgment Paris gave, snubbing her loveliness, the race she hated. What's the judgment Paris gave? Oh, the Yeah, which of the three is the fairest, right? We talked about that yesterday. Um, the honors given ran, uh, ravished Ganymede, Saturnian Juno, burning for it all, buffeted on the waste of sea those Trojans, left by the Greeks and pitiless, pitiless Achilles, keeping them far from Latium. For years they wandered as their destiny drove them on, from one sea to the next. So hard and huge a task it was to found the Roman people. Now for a good story, uh, you have to actually have tension like this, especially for an epic. Uh, you can't just say, uh, Aeneas is going to leave Troy and found Rome, the end, right? I mean, that's, that's how uh, perhaps a child will tell a story, but that's not how a very, very elaborate storyteller is going to tell it, right? Certainly not how an epic is going to be written. We have to have tension. And the tension in this uh, book is often going to be driven by the fact that one of the gods, a goddess named Juno, hates Aeneas preemptively. <laughs> not for what he's going to do, but what but for what his descendants will do to a city she loves. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, let me pause for a minute. I'm talking a lot. Uh, thoughts or comments on any of that? Would you say that this starts... It depends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it starts, what is it, Medius Race? Uh, yeah, in Medius Race. Yeah, Medias like, race. kind of in the middle. I, do you see that here? Uh, a little bit. Okay. I mean, what do you all think? There is some history, I mean, there's some things, you know, behind it, but oh, yeah. it doesn't really seem that it would start in Medias Race, but well, I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's uh, look at just the very next line from the one that we read. So on page four of book one, right at line 50, there's a, there's a little bit of that here because it says, they were all under sail in open water with Sicily just out of sight astern, all right? This, this, this is kind of like one of these, you know, 
uh, uh, 20th century uh, modern novels. You know, I went into the bathroom. I was like, who's the I? Well, you're not going to meet me until you know, the fourth chapter. Uh, they, who's they? Uh, the difference here is that Virgil's audience, let's say that this is being recited in the Forum in Rome, they're going to have a pretty good idea of what's going on here, if that makes sense. Uh, they're not waiting with bated breath. Oh, Aeneas? You know, who? <laughs> oh, he's one of the people who supposedly founded Rome? Okay, they're not, they're not doing that. They, they have an idea that, that this is somebody that there are legends about already. There are stories about him already. Now, it bears noting that uh, one of the things that Virgil here is doing is telling a founding myth, a founding story about Rome, but there were other founding myths about Rome. Does anybody know, and you, I think you will see this in the Dallaire's book as well, uh, but there are other stories about how Rome was founded besides the guy that we're going to read about here, Aeneas. Do you know one other very prominent one? Yeah. Just the two twin brothers. Yeah, the two twin brothers, Romulus and Remus, who were supposedly raised by a wolf. Um, the way that Livy tells the story is fascinating. They're, they're raised by a, 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 a wolf, a looper cow, um, and the name either means wolf or harlot. Okay, but, but Livy says, you know, we'll go with the wolf. Uh, that, that, that sounds better. Uh, in essence, they're raised by a wolf. They're nursed by a wolf. You've seen that very famous uh, sculpture of the two boys nursing out of the, the breast of the wolf. Um, and supposedly, Rome then is named after Romulus, uh, who interestingly kills his brother Ramus uh, in the process. Okay? Um, so there are other, there are other founding stories, um, but Virgil wants to uh, follow a tradition that has become popular in his time, which is to say, we're not descended from people raised by wolves, you know, whatever that is. Like, we're royalty. You know, we, we come from the line of the Trojans, someone who is a, a, a member of the royal house in Troy. There are efforts then to kind of harmonize the two accounts, and it gets very messy. But in essence, um, uh, Virgil is, is telling this founding myth in a way that will, will tell Romans that they come from a royal line. Okay? Who is Aeneas in terms of, of the, the royal line? We'll pick up on this a little bit as we keep reading, but. That's, that's what I was gonna ask, why, <laughs> why him? Because like in the Iliad, like there's so many Trojans that do oh, yeah. so many good things. Yep. Well, I mean, like your other things, and then you have him who was kind of mentioned once. Yep. And He's I know mentioned. from the Greek perspective, yep. but is it like, is this an actual guy who lived, in the, or is this just kind of like a myth that? Um, it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of convoluted answer to that, so I'll, I'll ramble on a little bit and then we'll kind of circle back, okay? And I'll try to summarize it a little bit, a little bit more succinctly. But in essence, um, Rome at this time um, has been in, in a kind of cultural uh, uh, period of engagement with Greece for a number of years. There's that famous line that captive Greece took Rome captive, okay? Rome is fighting with the Greeks and in that period is also absorbing much of Greek culture. One of the things that Virgil is setting out to do is to establish the origins of Rome set apart from the Greeks. Okay, enough of this <laughs> captive Greece capturing Rome. We are our own people and we have our own identity and one of the ways that you can do that is to establish a line that goes back to the Trojans rather than something over here with those Greeks. Okay, so why not use Achilles or someone like that? Well, one answer is, because those people were Greeks. Another answer for why to use uh, Aeneas as the father of Rome is so many of the other people were clearly killed, okay? Or there were very, very strong stories about them that had developed about them dying. You know, so Achilles uh, supposedly dies when he's shot by, uh, by Paris with an arrow, right? Some of the stories say he was hit in the Achilles heel, he was Achilles tendon. Um, so Virgil is kind of stuck with a number of characters that everybody know have already died. So he can't use those for his founding legend. And he's got one minor character, Aeneas, who shows up in book 20 of the, the Iliad in, in uh, kind of a passing way, but is somebody who successfully fights with Achilles. Uh, he fights with Achilles and fights to a draw. He's not killed by Achilles. Now, you know from reading the Iliad that anybody who fights with Achilles and isn't killed is some kind of a hero, right? Even Hector is killed by which, Achilles. Which book was that? Book 20. 20? Yeah. So um, he's, he's stuck a little bit in that regard. Uh, Aeneas is the cousin of Hector, okay? So if you're trying to trace your origins back to somebody we can all agree was something of a hero, and Hector's dead, <laughs> Aeneas is not a bad way, to, bad way to go. Does that make sense? So that's to kind of circle back. 
uh, Aeneas is Hector's cousin. And if you want to show the nobility of your people, going back to, to a cousin of Hector's, about, about as good as you can get. You know? This is sort of, you know, sort of like when you get pulled over by the police officer, and you're like, my brother-in-law's cousin is also a police officer. <laughs> you know, you're trying to establish this. But the farther it gets, the, 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 the more tenuous it is. <laughs> you know? You're still going to get a ticket if you pull that, right? But if, you're, if your brother is a police officer, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Um, so he's, he's trying to show nobility through this familial connection, okay? All right, uh, let's uh, uh, jump ahead a little bit um, and uh, look further in book one at Aeneas and his men who are going to discover the city of Carthage in the process of being constructed, okay? So what I, what I want you to imagine here is a scene that we saw many, many times in the Odyssey I say we saw, but you will see if you read the Odyssey, which is that uh, ships are beached on the shore, men come out, and they're, they're trying to think, okay, what's going on on this island? All right, well, they've beached themselves on the shore uh, next to uh, uh, a very early form of Carthage, which is just in the, the form of being constructed right now. And um, uh, uh, starting on page, um, I've got all my pages dog here, here. So page 18. Uh, line 573, uh, we'll read about Aeneas and uh, one of his men who decides to sneak forward on a reconnaissance mission. Okay, what's going on here? Let's see what's happening. Meanwhile, the two men pressed on where the pathway led, soon climbing a long ridge that gave a view down over the city and facing towers. Aeneas found where lately huts had been, marvelous buildings, gateways, cobbled ways, and din of wagons. There the Tyrians were hard at work, laying courses for walls, rolling up stones to build the citadel, while others picked out building sites and plowed a boundary furrow. Laws were being enacted, magistrates and the sacred senate chosen. Here men were dredging harbors. There they laid the deep foundation of a theater and quarried massive pillars to enhance the future stage. Wait for it. Then a simile. As bees in early summer and sunlight in the flowering fields hum at their work and bring along the young full grown to beehood as they cram their combs with honey, brimming all the cells with nectar, or take newcomers plunder, or like troops alerted drive away the lazy drones. Sorry, I have to take a breath. <laughs> and labor thrives in sweet time, sense the honey. Aeneas said, How fortunate these are whose city walls are rising here and now. That's quite a simile, isn't it? All right? That's, uh, that's Virgil thumbing his nose at Homer, going, I've, I got you, <laughs> right? Are you talking about that snake in his hole, right? And Hector was fearful of Achilles, kind of like a snake who waits in that little hole waiting for someone to step in it, okay? I've got bees in early summer. Um, it's vivid, isn't it? I mean, what, what did this city under construction look like? You could say it looked like a city under construction, or you could say it looks like bees in early summer, and sunlight in the flowering fields hum at their work. You see? I mean, it's a, it's a vivid image. It, it, it makes it a concrete, it concretizes this otherwise abstract idea. Uh, and Virgil does that a fair bit. Uh, he sometimes mocked for it. Uh, uh, people uh, tend to fall on one side or the other as to whether you like Virgil's uh, uh, form of, of similes. You know, is it, is it showing off too much, right? Um, when you, when you uh, spend time in the UK, you know, the, the, the one thing uh, a lot of British people are all about is, you know, not showing off too much, you know, just being yourself. Uh, and you can, you can see Virgil kind of puffing his chest out here in the forum and being like, wait for this, you know, I've got you. Um, so some people and, and some uh, uh, readers, even very early readers in the first couple centuries, um, didn't particularly care for this. Uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, most famous uh, fans of Virgil was uh, someone named St. Augustine. Ever heard of him? No. <laughs> right? Um, St. Augustine uh, says that when he was a boy, he was captured by the Aeneid. Uh, he read the Aeneid in school. He didn't care for Homer very much. His Greek wasn't very good, uh, but he loved the Aeneid. Um, he says it was one of those books that he wept when he read. Um, so uh, here is... Uh, um, a description of the, the city. Now we're going to um, uh, meet uh, the queen. Um, uh, starting uh, just at the end of that passage we read, he looked up at the roofs for he had entered, swathed in cloud, strange to relate among them, mingling with men yet visible to none. 
In Midtown stood a grove that cast sweet shade where the Phoenicians, shaken by wind and sea, had first dug up that symbol Juno showed them, a proud war has horse's head. This meant for Carthage, prowess in war and ease of life through ages. Here, being built by the Sidonian queen, was a great temple planned in Juno's honor, rich in offerings, and the godhead there. Steps led up to a sill of bronze with brazen lintel and bronze doors on groaning pins. Here in this grove, new things that met his eyes calmed Aeneas' fear for the first time. Here, for the first time, he took heart to hope for safety and to trust his destiny more, even in affliction. It was while he walked from one to another wall of the great temple and waited for the queen, staring amazed at Carthaginian promise at the handiwork of artificers and the toil they spent upon it. He found before his eyes the Trojan battles in the old war, now known throughout the world. This is one of the most beautiful passages in Virgil. Um, and we're going to see a little bit more of it. But what, what he is describing is that Aeneas, who we will find out, is one of the few who escaped the destruction of Troy, has landed his ship on the North African coast, and he walks up and realizes that a city is being built. And as he walks about and examines it, he realizes that there are frescoes of a sort, there are paintings that depict his and his family's sufferings. Uh, it's, a, it's a really beautiful image, okay? Uh, the, the great Atridae, Priam and Achilles, fierce in his rage at both sides. Here Aeneas halted and tears came. This is particularly beautiful in Latin, but in English, what spot on earth, he said, what region of the earth, Achates, that's his friend, is not full of the story of our sorrow. So what spot on earth, he said, what region of the earth, Achates, is not full of the story of our sorrow. Look, here is Priam, even so far away, great valor has due honor. They weep here for how the world goes, and our life that passes touches their hearts. Throw off your fear, this fame ensures some kind of refuge. This is a very Homeric theme with a, a strong Latin twist, a strong Roman twist. So let's, let's uh, read that again. What spot on earth, he said, what region of the earth, Achates, is not full of the story of our sorrow? Look, here is Priam. Even so far away, great valor has due honor. They weep here for how the world goes and our life that passes touches their hearts. Throw off your fear. This fame ensures some kind of refuge. What is he saying? What do you think he's saying? It's, it's, it's very Homeric with a Vir Virgilian twist. That this, this, this fame ensures some kind of refuge. Think of like... Um, the, the ideas that we talked about in the Iliad when it comes to uh, immortality. And, and think of the, the Greek idea of immortality, you know, when, when Hector speaks to, to uh, um, Andromache, his wife, and tells her about how he's going into battle, uh, even though he knows he's going to die. I mean, what? Yeah, he, he, he gets, gets to see that idea coming forth, like even though all of his friends are gone, mm -hmm. his family's gone, yep. everything is gone. Still sees the remnants of it being honored in a place that he mm -hmm. you know, didn't really know was there. The yes, place. and the 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 fame, the the recognition of their sufferings, uh, his family's sufferings, is some comfort to him, despite the fact that he's gone through it all. People know about it all around the world. Uh, now, the beauty of this, and the thing I always you know, emphasize very very uh, strongly, especially when I'm when I'm teaching high schoolers this, who are trying to figure out why they have to read this, you know. I'm you're sitting here reading this. <laughs> the, the fame of Aeneas, this, this description of this fame that has spread around the world, the, the story of his family's sufferings, is one that we're still reading and being touched by. Um, it's traveled around the world in his time, according to Virgil, but it's, it's still here. Um, and it's, it's kept alive, Virgil might say, um, through the beauty of the telling. Um, Virgil has recounted this to us in a way that is so beautiful that it will never die. You think here of, of one of uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, you know, the sonnet where he, he tells the, the woman that he loves um, how much uh, he loves her, even though he knows that she will die. But it's okay, because as long as this sonnet is around, you will live on in this sonnet, okay? It's a, it's a brag, <laughs> right? Uh, you are lovely, but you will die. But I'll tell you one thing that won't die, my poetry. <laughs> uh, go ahead. Job also, when he's in his suffering, he says, oh, that somebody would take up a pen of iron and write mm -hmm. down my sufferings. Mm -hmm. He says the same thing. 
pen of iron is such a beautiful King James uh, yes, phrase, is. isn't it? I yeah. love that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Um, other thoughts on, on any of this? Yeah. Well, now Dido's going to ask about the story. Yeah. And so he, he's in a place where he's recognized and uh, that, that goes on his people just for the now. Yeah. Kind of like that, that he's going to get help because of the suffering that's been told about him. Um, you know, it's, it's foreshadowing an event that's going to happen at the very end of this book and the beginning of the next, which is that Dido and, and her, her court are going to say, tell us about your sufferings, right? So it's kind of foreshadowing that. But he knows here that he's going to get a sympathetic hearing, right? Um, so uh, uh, Dido um, uh, paces over to him. She comes over to him. Um, it's kind of a relief to find Dido in the Aeneid. Uh, when you read the Iliad, there are very few women of any kind. Uh, the women who appear in the, the, uh, in the Iliad, um, as we saw yesterday, are often the spear women, so Chryseis or Briseis, who are taken as captives of war. Um, uh, uh, Hector's mother, Hecuba, and his wife Andromache play very minor roles. Uh, Dido is going to play a fairly prominent role um, in, in the Aeneid here, as we'll see. Um, so turn to the next page, page 21, um, and you'll just see this very uh, uh, um, kind of interesting description of the queen coming towards him at, the, the, uh, at line 676. Uh, the queen, talking about Dido, paced toward the temple in her beauty, Dido with a throng of men behind. A beautiful description of her as a leader, isn't it? Uh, all the men are following behind her. Um, who is Dido? Any ideas? When she's the queen of uh, Carthage. She's the queen of Carthage. She's a very important person. Yes, she's, she's a queen. She's found in Carthage. Uh, she is, according to the stories that kind of lurk in the background of this, uh, her brother is Pygmalion. Okay. Uh, does that name sound familiar? Uh, Pygmalion uh, is the name of a George Bernard Shaw uh, play from many years ago. Um, and it's the story of a, a sculptor who supposedly uh, creates a sculpture that's so beautiful, a woman that is so beautiful that he falls in love with her. And he begs for her to come to life, and she does. Okay? But um, uh, her, her brother, Pygmalion, uh, kills her husband. Okay? And she is forced to flee. Dido flees from uh, her city. She is uh, a Phoenician, so probably the city of Tyre, a biblical Tyre that you, you read about in the Old Testament that's uh, off, the, off the coast of, of that, that region, uh, a seafaring city. Um, and so Dido and some of her people also flee to found Carthage. Now this is significant lurking in the background here because there's a, a correspondence to a certain extent between Dido and Aeneas, is there not? She has also fled her city. She has come to found a new city. Aeneas has fled his city, and he's going to found a new city. So there's, there's kind of a correspondence between the two of them. Um, so she strides up. Uh, the two of them speak. It is very formulaic in that uh, Dido uh, represents the best of, of Greek uh, notions of, of hospitality. And Virgil is picking up on that and kind of romanizing it. But the, the Greek idea of hospitality is that when one sees a stranger, one invites him or her into your house. You feed him, clothe him if necessary, and then you ask about their journeys, okay? You don't, you don't try to figure out if this is a good or a bad person. Um, this is probably not great uh, advice on a practical level, but this is, how, this is how the Greeks thought about hospitality. Um, and the Odyssey is full of stories of people who don't show good hospitality. The suitors who go to Odysseus's house and eat him out of house and home, the many people who um, treat him like a peasant when he's disguised. Here, Dido is showing proper uh, hospitality, and uh, she invites Aeneas to her court, to her her home, to feast with her. And here on uh, page 29, so turn to page 29, uh, line 986. We read in a somewhat formulaic way, after the first pause in the feast and after trenchers were taken off, they put out wine bowls, grand and garlanded. A festive din now rose and echoed through the palace halls. Lighted lamps hung from the coffered ceiling, rich with gold leaf and torches with high flames prevailed over the night. 
And now the queen called for a heavy vessel with gems and gold that Bellis and his line had always used. She filled it, dipping wine, and her long hall fell silent. Jupiter, she prayed, you make the laws for hosting guests, they say. Grant that this, may, this day may be one of joy for Tyrians and men of Troy. Grant that it may be remembered by our descendants. Now be with us, Bacchus, giver of happiness and kindly Juno, and all you Tyrians attend in friendliness this meeting that unites us. At this she tilted a libation out and put the vessel lightly to her lips. Then with a jest gave it to Bidias, who nearly immersed himself in brimming gold as he drank from the foaming wine. The bowl passed them to other lords, and Lord Yopas, with flowing hair with whom giant Atlas taught, made the room echo to his golden lyre. He sang the straying moon and toiling sun, the origin of mankind and the beasts of rain and fire, and reigning Hyades, Architus, the great bear and little bear. The reason winter suns are in such haste to dip in ocean, or what holds the nights, endless in winter. Um, it's, a, it's a scene of a feast, it's a scene of great drinking, uh, and at the end of this feast, uh, she is going to then do the thing that we've grown accustomed if we've read the Odyssey to seeing, which is say, friend, tell me about your journeys. And here we, we see it at the bottom of this page. Come rather than, she said, dear guest, and tell us from the beginning the Greek stratagems, the ruin of your town and your seafaring, as now the seventh summer brings you here, from wanderings all the lands and all the seas. Turn the page. The room fell silent and all eyes were on him as Father Aeneas from his high couch began. Sorrow too deep to tell, your majesty, you order me to feel and tell once more how the Danans leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom, heartbreaking things I saw with my own eyes and was myself a part of. Who could tell them, even a Myrmidon or a Dilopian or a ruffian of Ulysses, without tears? We're gonna break there. So we'll take a, a five minute break. Uh, feel free to get a snack upstairs. And when we come back, we'll hear Aeneas' tale. Uh, I want to just show you, though, before we, uh, we do break, uh, what Dido is going to do in response to the story. Okay, so before our break, uh, after hearing uh, Aeneas' story, here is what uh, she says. The queen, for her part, all that evening ached with longing that her heart's blood fed, a wound of inward fire eating her away. The manhood of the man, his pride of birth, came home to her time and again. His looks... His words remained with her to haunt her mind, and desire for him gave her no rest. So it's going to be a good story. I love that phrase, the manhood of the man. <laughs> All right, uh, break there. We'll take about five minutes, if that works. Uh, get a little snack or something, and then we'll come back and we'll go a little bit longer.
Oh yeah. Yeah. From '93. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the 2000 version. Yeah. yeah. Good to go when you are, Doug. All right, so I'll just uh, show you real, real quick here this uh, Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. This is the book that I was mentioning. Um, uh, Becca Meaner, uh, who was in here earlier and will be in uh, later this afternoon, um, mentioned that there's an updated version of this, so she might be able to bring that in and, and show you that as well. I'll just pass this around. Um, if you want to take a quick look at it, the, the artwork in it is quite beautiful. Um, so take a look as we're um, traveling forward now in the Aeneid together. Um, so just to recap very quickly, uh, Dido, the queen of Carthage, has just asked Aeneas to tell his story. And um, at the beginning of, of book two, uh, we read his statement, sorrow too deep to tell your majesty, you order me to feel and tell once more how the Danans leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom. Heartbreaking things I saw with my own eyes it was myself a part of. Who could tell them? Even a Myrmidon or Dilopian or Ruffian of Ulysses without tears. Now too the night is well along with dew fall out of heaven and setting stars weigh down our heads towards sleep. But if so great desire moves you to hear the tale of our disasters, briefly recall the final throes of Troy, however it may shudder at the memory and shrink again in grief, let me begin. It's a good intro, isn't it? Um, He's grabbing your attention. He's telling you that uh, this is a sorrow-inducing event, um, and just just telling it gives him sorrow. Knowing their strength broken in warfare, turned back by the fates in years, so many years already slipped away. The Danan captains, by the divine handicraft of Pallas, built a horse of timber tall as a hill and sheathed its ribs with planking of cut pine. This they gave out to be an offering. Um, turning the page here. While we're turning the page, let me just make a comment. Uh, the word Danan, D-A-N-A-A-N, is uh, Greek, okay? Um, so you're going to see that word a fair bit. Uh, so turning the, uh, the page, this they gave out to be an offering for a safe return by sea, and the word went round. But on the sly, they shut inside a company chosen from their picked soldiery by lot, crowding the vaulted caverns in the dark, the horse's belly with men f fully armed. Now, he's going to go on and tell the story of the fall of Troy. Remember, this is the story that uh, Homer doesn't tell. People have an idea of what happened. There's something called an epic cycle. There are many different uh, uh, plays and stories told between the time of Homer and the time of Virgil. So people would have a sense that there's this story that Troy uh, fell at the hands of the Greeks through this stratagem, through the use of a, a, a cunning device, um, and in particular, a wooden horse, as we're about to see. Offshore, there's a long island, Tenedos, famous and rich while Priam's kingdom lasted, a treacherous anchorage now and nothing more. They crossed to this and hid their ships behind it on the bare shore beyond. We thought they'd gone, sailing home to Mycenae before the wind, so Teucer's town is freed of all her long anguish, gates thrown wide. And out we go in joy to see the Dorian campsites, all deserted, the beach they left behind. Here the Dilopians pitched their tents. Here cruel Achilles lodged. There lay the ships, and there formed up in ranks. They came inland to fight us. Of our men, one group stood marveling, gaping up to see the dire gift of the cold, unbedded goddess, the sheer mass of the horse. The Moetes shouted, It should be hauled inside the wall and moored higher on the, ci high on the citadel, whether by treason or just because Troy's fate went that way now. Capus opposed him. So did the wiser heads. Into the sea with it, they said, or burn it. Build up a bonfire under it, this trick of the Greeks, a gift no one can trust, or cut it open, search the hollow belly. Do you get the scene? Okay. The uh, Greek armies have, through a cunning device, um, and we learn in other places, through the advice of Ulysses, or Odysseus, one of the most cunning of the Greek generals, um, they have uh, uh, built a giant wooden horse. They have left it on the seashore, packed with men. Their men uh, inside of the belly of the wooden horse. They then pack up uh, the rest of the men, the rest of the army and their provisions and whatnot, onto the boats, take the boats out past an island, and hide behind the island. Does this make sense? 
So now the Greek, now the, now the, the Greek ships are hidden from view uh, on the shore. Now the Trojans come out, all they see is a giant wooden horse. They don't see any Greek army, they don't see any Greek ships. And the Trojans are divided. What do we do with this giant wooden horse? Now the horse is significant. We talked about horse taming Hector, or horse breaking Hector, Hector the breaker of horses. Troy may have been known at that time for being a, a center for raising horses, for breaking wild horses. Um, the the uh, division in the ranks of the Trojans is, do we treat this as some sort of peace offering by the Greeks, or do we treat it as a trap? The cautious perspective would be, <laughs> this is clearly a trap. <laughs> there's somebody inside of this. <laughs> um, but there's a division of the uh, opinions on it. Um, contrary notions, line 55 at the bottom, contrary notions pulled the crowd apart. Next thing we knew in front of everyone, Lao Kun with a great company came furiously running from the height and still far off cried out, oh my poor people, men of Troy, what madness has come over you? Can you believe the enemy truly gone? A gift from the Danans and no ruse? Is that Ulysses' way as you have known him? Achaeans must be hiding in this timber. It was built to butt against our walls, peer over them into our houses, pelt the city from the sky. From the sky. Some crookedness is in this thing. Have no faith in the horse. Now, one of the most famous lines in all of Latin literature, okay? Uh, the line that, you know, the, the, the first year Latin schoolboy uh, memorizes in Latin. Whatever it is, even when the Greeks bring gifts, I fear them, Greeks and all. Timeo Donaos et Dona Ferentis. Timeo Donaos et Dona Ferentis is the Latin phrase. Um, Schoolboys have been uh, reciting that for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, I fear the Greeks and their gifts, or the gifts they bring. Um, but now look, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, just continuing from uh, Lao Kun's warning, uh, Line 71, he broke off then and rifled his big spear with all his might against the horse's flank, the curve of belly. It stuck there trembling and the rounded hull reverberated, groaning at the blow. If the God's will had not been sinister, if our own minds had not been crazed, he would have made us foul that Argive den with bloody steel and Troy would stand today, O citadel of Priam, towering still. Do you get what's happened there? A priest named Lao Kun has rushed out to the shore. He sees the, the um, wooden horse, and he says, I fear the Greeks and their gifts, or I fear the Greeks and the gifts they bring. He takes his spear, and he throws it into the belly of the horse. And um, uh, Aeneas says, basically, if the fates, if the gods hadn't been against us, that would have been the end, uh, because uh, perhaps a Greek would have screamed or yelled from inside, and people would have heard it, you know. But that, that didn't happen. But now look, Hillmen, shepherds of Dardania, raising a shout, dragged him before the king, an unknown fellow with hands tied behind. This all as he himself had planned, volunteering, letting them come across him so he could open Troy to the Achaeans. Sure of himself, this man was braced for it, either way to work his trick or die. Uh, who is this man? Who are they bringing in as a captive? Did you pick up on his name? Uh, yeah, he's, he's been captured uh, by, by shepherds. Uh, his name is Sinon, S-I-N-O-N, Sinon. Um, and he will introduce himself to the Trojans as a, uh, a man who has been betrayed by the Greeks and left on the, on the shore to die. Okay? But he's in on the plan. Okay? So Sinon is a, a uh, treacherous man. He is part of the Greeks' stratagem to confuse the Trojans and make them think that the, the horse is actually a gift. Um, Where do you get the name? Uh, turn the page. Um, and uh, page 36, line 109, uh, he speaks, um, starting, starting line 106, I'll tell you the whole truth, my lord, no matter what may come of it. Argive I am by birth and will not say I am not. That first of all, fortune has made a derelict of Sinon but the bitch won't make an empty liar of him too. Probably edit that out, Doug, uh, that, that word if we have to, but um, fortune has made a derelict of Simon. There's his name, okay? Um, there's a long uh, tradition in Greek and Roman uh, uh, mythology that Fortuna is a woman and that she is uh, unconstant, that she uh, favors 
someone, perhaps in their youth, but then she turns and betrays him. Okay, so Sinan is saying here um, uh, that Fortune has betrayed him, Lady Fortuna has betrayed him, but she won't make a liar out of him. He's lying. <laughs> I mean, there's irony in this, right? Uh, Fortune has betrayed me, but she won't make a liar of me. Um, uh, uh, the most famous uh, discussion of, of Lady Fortuna in this regard uh, happens um, on the part of, of Hannibal uh, at, in one of his very last battles, right before he's defeated by the Romans for the very last time, where he tells a much younger general, be careful, you're young. You think that Lady Fortuna is constant, but she's not. I was young once too. <laughs> I thought that she would be with me all my life, but she's not. Uh, she betrayed me. Uh, Sinan is picking up on that, that that uh, story that fortune favors some and then throws them over. And he's saying, she's thrown me over, but I'll still tell the truth. She won't make a liar out of me. She's not going to, he's going to lie. Um, uh, uh, he tells a story in which the Greeks have uh, left him there, uh, essentially um, uh, as a, a prisoner of fortune, as someone who is going to probably be killed by the Trojans. And um, his story is so compelling that a number of the, the Trojans believe it. And if you go to page 38, starting on line 196, take a minute to get there. I'll, I'll give you a minute to get there. Um, Sinan says, uh, uh, um, sorry, Virgil says through Aeneas here that for tears we gave him life and pity too, talking about Sinan. Priam himself ordered the jives, or, meaning the, the chains or bonds removed, and the tight chain between. In kindness then, he said to him, whoever you may be, the Greeks are gone. Forget them from now on. You shall be ours. And answer me in these questions. Who put this huge thing up, this horse? Who designed it? What do they want with it? Is it religious or a means of war? These were his questions. Then the captive, trained in trickery in this stagecraft of Achaea, lifted his hands unfettered to the stars. He's going to lie, and he's going to begin his lies by invoking the gods. This is a powerful kind of lie. Eternal fires of heaven, he began, powers inviolable, I swear by thee, as by the altars and blaspheming swords I got away from, and the gods' white bands, I wore as one chosen for sacrifice. This is justice. I am justified in dropping all allegiance to the Greeks, as I had cause to hate them. I may bring into the open what would be kept dark. No laws of my own country bind me now. Only be sure you keep your promises and keep faith, Troy, as you are kept from harm if what I say proves true, if what I give is great and valuable. This is very ironic. Um, I think you mentioned yesterday, Jim, some of the irony and epic. Look at this. Only be sure you keep your promises and keep faith, Troy, as you are kept from harm if what I say proves true. Um, don't lie to me, he's saying. I'll tell you the truth, but don't lie to me. Uh, you be honest with me, um, as he betrays them, as he leads them down a false path. So what he is going to do is to tell them that uh, this is a, a gift, an offering of sorts by the Greeks. There's no harm in this, okay? And you know, if you were to tear down your walls and take it into the city, it's no problem. Yeah. I have a question. So yesterday sure. we talked about uh, Achilles kind of taking the body of Hector and then yeah. And, and dishonoring it, and yeah. that's against the codes of war. Yes. Would this be considered something that's against the codes of war, actually lying by invoking uh, the gods? It depends whether you're a Greek or a Roman, I guess. Um, the Greeks tell all sorts of stories, especially about Odysseus and his craftiness. Um, there, there are several things that are probably going on here, though. Uh, one is um, um, Virgil showing how the, the Greek uh, mastery of the Trojans had as its core cunning and deceit. Okay, so the, the distancing the Romans from the Greeks to some extent. Um, that's it one removed from it though. More in the story, remember that Aeneas is on a couch after a feast telling these people in Carthage about what happened. It's really important that he portrays the betrayal of his city as something that nobody could have seen. Does this make sense? Okay, because a, 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 an avid listener, okay, somebody paying close attention, is likely to ask and he asks, well, <laughs> you were there, <laughs> right? I mean, what were you doing while this was happening? Why didn't you intervene? So he has to portray this very, very cunning, clever treachery to you know, exculpate himself from blame for what happened. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, 
But you know, does this go against the, the rules of war? Yes, but it's something that's done a lot, especially by Greeks. That would be, I think, what Virgil might say. Um, it's against the rules of war, like the Greeks are always going against the rules of war. Um, thing other is, the thoughts thing, on that? Yeah. Things don't change very much. No, they don't. In all these years, that's basically what uh, Patton did against the Germans in yeah, I mean it's a in England. it's a recurring yeah sure I you know, had, it, had inflatable yep. equipment yep. and so forth that yeah so leading up to the D-Day invasion having a fake army positioned in one place in in England to make the Germans think that the invasion wasn't going to happen in Normandy it would happen at that Pas de Calais I think right um, yeah I mean deception is at the heart of war but everybody says that it's not supposed to be practice you know um, so look at uh, uh, page 40, line uh, 268. This fraud of Sinon, his accomplished lying, won us over. A tall tale and fake tears had captured us, whom neither Diomedes nor Laresian Achilles overpowered, nor ten long years, nor all their thousand ships. It's a really powerful statement, isn't it? Ten years of fighting the Greeks and they couldn't beat us. Uh, but one really well told lie brought our city down. And now another sign more fearful still broke on our blind, miserable people, filling us all with dread. Laocoon, acting as Neptune's priest that day by law, was on the point of putting to the knife a massive bowl before the appointed altar, when, ah, look there, from Tenedus on the calm sea, twin snakes, I shiver to recall it, endlessly coiling, uncoiling, swam abreast for shore, their underbelly showing as their crests reared red as blood above the swell. Now, look at the description of these, these snakes that he's going to give. It's, it's a, I think um, several of you yesterday, but Abe in particular talked about a kind of horrible beauty in epic. Uh, I think it was something, I'm, I'm not phrasing it perfectly as you did, but something like that, you know, this horrific beauty. This is a horrifyingly beautiful passage and also a prophetic passage about what's going to happen to Troy. Um, so coiling, uncoiling, swim abreast for sure, their underbelly showing as their crests reared red as blood above the swell. Behind, they glided with great undulating backs now came the sound of thrashed seawater foaming. Now they were on dry land and we could see their burning eyes, fiery and, f and suffused with blood, their tongues a flicker out of hissing maws. We scattered, pale with, with fright, but straight ahead they slid until they reached Laocoon. Each snake enveloped one of his two boys, twining about and feeding on the body. Next they ensnared the man as he ran up with weapons, coils like cables looped and bound him twice round the middle, Twice about his throat, they whipped their back scales and their heads towered, while with both hands he fought to break the knots, drenched in slime, his headbands black with venom, sending to heaven his appalling cries, like a slashed bull escaping from an altar. The fumbled axe shrugged off. The pair of snakes now flowed away and made for the highest shrines, the citadel of Pitalus and Minerva, where coiling they took cover at her feet, under the rondure of her shield. New terrors ran in the shaking crowd. The word went round. Laocoon had paid, and rightfully, for profanation of the sacred hulk with his offending spear hurled at its flank. Okay? Now, that is a just really vivid passage, a beautiful passage. Um, do you see words like red, blood, <laughs> um, uh, fiery, burning <laughs> in that passage? It is, it is prophetic of what is coming to Troy. Right? The, the blood will flow, there will be fire, it will burn. And you see it in these prophetic snakes that are, are, are slithering on top of the ocean and onto the shore. And yet the people who see this prophecy take it as punishment for Lao Kun offending this gift offering. Does that make sense? So they see that the snakes came up onto the shore and stole away Lao Kun and his sons and, and, and killed them and went back into the, uh, into the ocean. And all the people standing there say, this should, just, this should teach us a lesson. Not that Troy is about to fall by fire, <laughs> but this should teach us to be respectful of this horse. Does that make sense? Okay, so they're, they're seeing events and they're misreading them. Um, the offering must be hauled to its true home, they clamored. Votive prayers to the goddess must be said there. So we breached the walls and laid the city open. It's just a bad move. I mean, these are your walls that supposedly have, have kept you safe for 10 years. Uh, the legend about the walls of Troy is that they were actually built by the god Neptune, that Priam convinced Neptune to build these walls for the city. Okay, so these are impregnable walls and they tear them down. 
uh, to get the horse in. Everyone pitched in to get the figure underpinned with rollers, hempen lines around the neck, deadly, pregnant with enemies. The horses crawled upward to the beach. Now there's some really interesting literary correspondences here. Um, the figure is underpinned with rollers, lines around the neck, okay? It is what they are doing to the horse in wrapping it up and pulling it into the city is similar to, to what the snakes have done to Lao Kun and his sons. I won't, I won't beat it to death, but you get the point. They're wrapping up the horse and pulling it in. The snakes wrapped up the sun and pulled them away. That's interesting. But here's something else that's interesting. Deadly, pregnant with enemies, the horse crawled upward to the beach. Now, that is a, a brilliant analogy to pregnancy, isn't it? This horse is, horse is about to birth fire and blood and destruction. Uh, but it's described as a pregnancy. Um, we'll see that uh, pregnancy metaphor again in a moment. Um, so all the people drag the horse into the city and they feast and they celebrate. Now, turning the page, line 336, as heaven turned, night from the ocean stream came on, profound in gloom on earth and sky, and Myrmidons in hiding. In their homes, the Teucrians lay silent, wearied out, and sleep enfolded them. The Argive feet, drawn up in line abreast, left Tinnitus through the aloof moon's friendly stillnesses and made for the familiar shore. Flame signal shone from the command ship. Sinon, favored by what the gods unjustly had decreed, stole out to tap the pine walls and set free the Danans in the belly. Open wide, the horse emitted them. Gladly they dropped out of the cabin. cavern. Captains first. And it gives the list. What I want to uh, point out there, though, is that this horse that was pregnant with these men is now giving birth in the city. It's a, it's a really compelling image, isn't it? But what the, the birth is going to bring destruction. Um, Aeneas is going to relate to his audience that he was asleep at the time, but that he got a vision. Um, and if you turn the page, just to the, the next page, so page 43, we'll see the vision. That time of night it was when the first sleep, gift of the gods, begins for ill mankind. You see at the top there? Arriving gradually, delicious rest in sleep and dream, Hector appeared to me, gaunt with sorrow, streaming tears, all torn, as by the violent car on his death day, and black with bloody dust, his puffed out feet cut by the raw hide thongs. Ah God, the look at him, how changed from that proud Hector who returned to Troy wearing Achilles' armor, or that one who pitched the torches on Danian ships, his beard all filth, his hair matted with blood, showing the wounds, the many wounds, received outside his father's city walls. I seem myself to weep and call upon the man in grieving speech brought from the depth of me. Uh, skipping down to line 384. What has happened to ravage your serene face? Why these wounds? So um, here is Hector appearing again to Aeneas, but appearing again through Virgil after 700 years of stories about Hector being desecrated after his death. And so Virgil picks up on those, those memories of the desecrated body of Hector and shows Hector with those wounds. You know, the, the rawhide, the, the puffed feet and those sorts of things. The, the feet that are puffed from the rawhide thongs and so on. Um, Hector is going to an, uh, warn Aeneas that the city is uh, going to be destroyed. And so Aeneas must do something, which we're going to talk about a great deal in the class. Aeneas must demonstrate pietas. So I'm going to put this word up on the, the board. It's going to be the word that... We're going to go back to many times later as we continue reading the Aeneid. Pietas. Um, probably guess what pietas means, right? Piety. Um, I mean, essentially, piety, but Roman piety. Um, Roman ideals of what a man uh, should be like. Uh, the pietas that uh, Aeneas is going to show is going to consist in going to his father's house rescuing his father, going to uh, rescue his wife, Crucia, and uh, their son, um, who, who goes by several names, Eulus or Ascanius. If you saw Ascanius or Eulus being used interchangeably, that's because he goes by either. Okay? It's one of the many things that uh, writers like Virgil do to confuse us. So, um, <laughs> it's just for you, Scott. <laughs> um, it's a gift. All right, uh, page 46, uh, down at the, the bottom, um, we're going to see one uh, interesting simile as Aeneas is on his way to demonstrate pietas. Um, 
he is uh, uh, on his way to uh, his house and he runs into uh, a Greek who is in the process of plundering the city. Um, and so Aeneas uh, um, exchanges words with him and at the very bottom of the page um, we see his words were barely out and no reply forthcoming credible him when he knew himself fallen among enemies thunderstruck he halted foot in voice and then recoiled okay so here's Aeneas who's run into a Greek who's plundering and initially the Greek thinks that Aeneas is another Greek who's there to plunder uh, but then he realizes this is a Trojan and watch this simile uh, recoiled like one who steps upon a uh, steps down on a lurking snake in a briar patch and jerks back terrified as the angry thing rears up all puffed and blue so backward went Androgeus okay now that is that is uh, Virgil picking up on those Homeric similes remember the, the simile of the snake in the hole he's doing the same thing here he's rearing back uh, like like a snake um, Aeneas kills this individual, he kills a number of other people, um, and then he sees something which he describes as, as one of the, the greatest things that brings him sorrows. Um, he sees the fate of King Priam. So turn to uh, page 51, and we'll see how uh, King Priam is going to die. What was the fate of King Priam, you may ask? So, uh, top of page uh, 51, it's line 659, uh, 58, there about. Uh, what was the fate of Priam, you may ask? Seeing his uh, city captive, seeing his own royal portals rent apart, his enemies in the inner rooms, the old man uselessly put on his shoulders, shaking with old age, armor unused for years, belted a sword on and made for the masked enemy to die. This is epic, okay? This is Priam, the old man who takes the armor that's been rusting for decades and puts it on, and it doesn't fit. The story of David putting on the armor of Saul, and it, it doesn't seem to fit him. Why? Because he's too small. Here we have the armor that an old man is putting on that looks ridiculous, uh, but it looks terrifyingly sad, too, because old men don't go to war, or they shouldn't. Um, under the open sky in a central court stood a big altar, near it a laurel tree of great age, leaning over in deep shade, embowered the Penates. At this altar, Hecuba and her daughters, like white doves, blown down in a black storm, clung together, enfolding holy images in their arms. There's so much here. Um, I'm going to put one word up on the board that's going to be helpful um, to kind of go back to because I'm going to be making reference to it. The Penates. Anybody know what the Penates are? They are household gods. Okay? So the uh, sculpture that I, I showed you at the outset of today's class that showed Aeneas, uh, his father Anchises, and uh, little Eulus or Ascanius, um, if you looked at it very closely, which you can do sometime, um, you'll see that the father is actually holding what, what are the, the household gods. Okay? You put these uh, on the hearth in your home if you're a Roman, especially a Roman man, and they protect your home. Now, this is what we call an anachronism. Uh, the the, the uh, Trojans probably didn't have household gods like this. Okay? So Virgil is importing back into this story a Roman tradition of having household gods. Okay? So here are uh, uh, Priam, uh, his wife Hecuba, and her daughters. Now look at this simile, like white doves blown down in a black storm clung together. Have you seen doves huddling together? I mean, that, that's vivid. You know what they look like. They're absolutely terrified. This is abject terror. Um, now seeing Priam in a young man's gear, she, speaking of Hecuba, calls out, my poor husband, what mad thought drove you to buckle on these weapons? Where are you trying to go? The time is past for help like this, for this kind of defending, even if my own Hector could be here. Come to me now, the altar will protect us, or else you'll die with us. Why are they huddled around the altar? They're huddled around the altar with the household gods because, like frightened doves, it's the only place they think that they can find any kind of security. Uh, there's a description of a laurel tree that's, that's overlooking them, which is symbolic of being under shade or protection. They've gone to the altar because they believe that perhaps it is the only thing in the city that will, will cause the Greek uh, soldiers who are savagely massacring everyone to pull up. 
they will, they will uh, respect the, the altar. I mean, you think of medieval traditions of finding refuge in a church, for instance, if you've committed a crime. I mean, there's, there's that kind of idea that if I, if I hold on to the altar, am I near the altar, the soldier will not kill me. She drew him close, heavy with tears, to rest on the consecrated stone. Now see, Polites, one of Priam's sons, escaped from Pyrrhus's butchery and on the run, through enemies and spears, down colonnades, through empty courtyards, wounded. Close behind comes Pyrrhus, burning for the death stroke, has him, catches him now, and lunges with the spear. Um, Pyrrhus, by the way, is, is one of uh, Achilles' uh, sons. The boy has reached his parents and before them goes down, pouring out his life with blood. Now Priam, in the very midst of danger, or sorry, the very midst of death, would neither hold his peace nor spare his anger. For what you've done, for what you've dared, he said, if there is care in heaven for atrocity, may the gods render fitting thanks, reward you as you deserved. You forced me to look on at the destruction of my son, defile the father's eyes with death. That great Achilles you claim to be the son of, and you lie, was not like you to Priam, his enemy, to me, who threw himself upon his mercy, he showed compunction, gave me back for burial the bloodless corpse of Hector, and returned me to my own realm. Now, you remember that passage. You know what's being referred to. So Virgil has an audience who's familiar with the uh, image of Priam begging Achilles for the, the um, body of Hector, and here it comes up again. Priam reminds this supposed son of Achilles, who he says, you lie, you're not really his son, but be that as it may, uh, that your own father was better than you. The old man threw his spear with feeble impact, blocked by the ringing bronze. It hung there, harmless, from the jutted boss. Then Pyrrhus answered, you'll report the news to Polites, my father. Don't forget my sad behavior, the, degener the degeneracy of Neopto uh, sorry, Neoptolemus. Now die. With this to the altar step itself, he dragged him, trembling, slipping in the pooled blood of his son, and took him by the hair with his left hand. The sword flashed in his right up to the hilt. He thrust it in his body. That was the end of Priam's age, the doom that took him off, with Troy in flames before his eyes, his towers headlong fallen. He that in other days had ruled in pride so many lands and peoples, the power of Asia. On the distant shore, the vast trunk headless lies without a name. That's a powerful passage, isn't it? Um, when, um, when Pyrrhus uh, grabs Priam and drags him in the blood of his son and then, then kills him uh, with the sword, he is, he is in a sense sacrificing uh, Priam. I mean, there's an altar there. There is the blood of a victim down on the, the ground. That is, it is very symbolic of a sacrifice of sorts. And you picture Priam, this old man, having now lost every one of his sons uh, looking at the final ruin of his city and coming to his end. You see why Aeneas would say, this causes me sorrow to repeat this. It's a, it's a tragic end. Remember we said that, that epics are not just about foundings, they're about falls, they're about endings. This is a fall, this is an ending, um, and it's told in a powerful way. Um, for the first time that night, turning to the next page, inhuman shuddering took me head to foot I stood unmanned, and my dear father's image came to mind, as our king, just his age, mortally wounded, gasped his life away before my eyes. Crucia, that's his wife, Crucia is the wife of Aeneas, came to mind too, left alone, the house plundered, danger to little Eulus, that's his son, Arwis Eulus, little Eulus. Uh, I looked around to take stock of my men, but all had left me, utterly played out, giving their beaten bodies to the fire or plunging from the roof. It came to this, that I stood there alone, okay? So he is now going to recount to his listeners how he shows pietas, okay? How he shows piety. He is going to go and rescue his father, rescue his wife, and rescue uh, his, his son, and he will rescue the household gods, the penates, and take them and go and found a new city. But there's a there's a glitch. Something goes wrong. What goes wrong in that whole process? He makes a mistake. The wife, the yes. Wife yes. Make it. He's so going he's to. With just the father and the son, the three yes. generations. Correct. Um, <clears throat> so in this in this process, he will go. He will um, uh, uh, collect his father, his son, and his wife, 
but in the process he will actually leave, he'll leave the house at one point, and his wife will die. She will be uh, uh, killed and the house will be set on fire. So he ends up only being able to rescue his father and his son. Um, <clears throat> look at uh, uh, page um, uh, 58 and we're gonna see how this is, this is described. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, awfully beautiful passage. Um, uh, page 58 at the bottom. When I had said this over the breadth of my shoulder and bent neck, I spread out a lion skin for Tawny Cloak and stooped to take his, meaning Anchises, his father's weight. Then little Eulus put his hand in mine and came with shorter steps beside his father. We said um, uh, yesterday that there's something uh, gripping about um, uh, Hector speaking to Astyanax, and there's something gripping about the fact that that's just how a father talks to a kid. Um, there's something gripping about this that uh, uh, Virgil takes the time to tell us that Eulus took shorter steps than his father. Um, if you've walked with a kid, you know that that's what it looks like. Um, so, little Eulus put his hand in mine and came with shorter steps beside his father. My wife fell in behind. Through shadowed places on we went, and I, lately unmoved by any spear's thrown, any squads of Greeks, Felt terror now at every eddy of wind, alarm at every sound, alert and worried, alike for my companion and my burden. I had got near the gate, and now I thought we had made it all the way, when suddenly a noise of running feet came near at hand, and peering through the gloom ahead, my father cried out, Run, boy, here they come, I see flame, light on shields, bronze shining. I took fright, and some unfriendly power, I know not what, stole all my addled wits, for as I turned aside from the known way, entering a maze of pathless places on the run, alas, Crucia, taken from me, from us by grim fate, did she linger or stray or sink in weariness? There is no telling. Never would she be restored to us. Never did I look back or think to look for her, lost as she was, until we reached the funeral mound and shrine of venerable Ceres. Here at last all came together, but she was not there. She alone failed her friends, her child, her husband. Out of my mind, whom did I not accuse? What man or god, what crueler loss had I beheld that night the city fell? Ascanius, my father, and the two Korean Penates, I left in my friend's charge. The Penates, the household gods, yes. Um, I left in my friend's charge and hid them well in a hollow valley. I turned back alone into the city, cinching my bright harness. Nothing for it but to run the risks again, go back again, comb all of Troy, and put my life in danger as before. Now, earlier in that passage when he says, who did I not blame? In past classes when I've taught this, uh, a bunch of people have always said, well, yourself. <laughs> like saying, I'm shouting out blame at all these people who lost Crucia. Well, <laughs> there's an argument to be made. It was you. Um, in any event, uh, and so on backward, tracing my own footsteps through the night, and everywhere my heart misgave me. Even stillness had its terror. Then to our house, thinking she might, just might, have wandered there. Danans had got in and filled the place, and at that instant, fire they had set. Okay? skipping down to 1002, so just further down the page, middle of that page. Then to my vision her sad wraith appeared, Crucia's ghost, larger than life, before me. Chilled to the marrow, I could feel the hair on my head rise, the voice clawed in my throat, but she spoke out to ease me of my fear. What's to be gained by giving way to grief so madly, my sweet husband? Nothing here has come to pass except as heaven willed. You may not take Crucia with you now, it was not so ordained, nor does the Lord of High Olympus give you leave. For you, long exile waits, and long sea miles to plow. She gives some prophecies there, but then skipping to the next page, uh, line 1024. Farewell now, cherish still your son and mine. With this she left me weeping, wishing that I could say so many things, and faded on the tenuous air. Three times I tried to put my arms around her neck, three times enfolded nothing as the wraith slipped through my fingers bodiless as the wind, were like a fitting dream. All the way to the bottom. So I resigned myself, picked up my father, and turned my face toward the mountain range. And there you, you see him, father on his shoulder, son at his side, uh, three generations uh, traveling to uh, found the city of Rome. I have a few more things to say, but let me stop there and ask your thoughts. What do you think about that book in particular, yeah. I just, like, I'm trying to connect this to what we read yesterday. Sure, good. And, like, Hector, he leaves wife and son to go fight yep. 
Um, it just kind of seems like uh, Aeneas's reaction is maybe a little bit different. Uh, yeah. like he just he doesn't fight. He wants to flee and then leaves wife behind. There's there yeah. There's something going on there. I think you're right to pick up on that. Um, that we probably would do well to flesh out a little bit. Um, it has to do with the fact that uh, in the Aeneid, as in the Odyssey, we have a, re a narrator whose reliability we might question at times. Okay? You, you didn't see this in the Odyssey, but you will if you read the Odyssey, that on occasion, Odysseus will say, I'm a man of many ways, full of many, many devices. I've told many false stories in the past. Now listen to my story, and trust me, every bit of it is true. Right? You go, hmm. <laughs> uh, Aeneas is telling a story to Dido and to her friends about the fall of Troy and his role in that. And many scholars have at times questioned how reliable this account really was. Um, you know, when we come to the loss of the wife, he seems very uh, keen to, to explain everything that he did. There are times, a number of them that we uh, uh, kind of had to skip over due to time here, but there are passages in, in book two where he portrays himself as kind of the, the, the last Hector of uh, uh, Troy. You know, he's Arnold Schwarzenegger going out on his own to kind of kill Greeks to get back at them. Um, he is, he is uh, pitching a view of himself to his audience, and many, many people have picked up on that. Now, to what extent is he different from Hector? That's a really interesting question. You know, with Hector leaving his wife and children and going out to fight, here's Aeneas taking them and fleeing, losing the wife along the way. It's an interesting comparison. <clears throat> Other well, thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, how does, it, how does fleeing the city and not staying to fight the way Brian did, how is that an example of his piety? How do you think? It's not. So, yeah. I mean, if he's trying to demonstrate that, he's done the opposite and mm -hmm. saying, I grabbed my wife, kids, father, and ran. Yep. Like, it's the opposite of him. On the face of it, it's not at all, is it? Right. It looks like cowardice. Except, <laughs> we're going to get to this. Uh, because we're going to see that he's going to he's going to pull the same thing on Dido. He's going to develop a relationship with Dido, and then he'll get to the point where he'll say, well, it's been real. <laughs> I'm out. Which seems like cowardice. It seems like the opposite of piety, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Except it's not. <laughs> it's not for, it's not for Virgil. Author. It's not for Virgil. Okay. Is, is it because of the gods? Because yes. he's mentioning here how, oh, well, this is the way the gods had to be, and then when he leaves Dido, the gods are like, hey, you gotta go because you, yep. you need to find Italy, and yep. you, need to, you need to find your new home. And like he feels for Dido, but he's, he like, I don't know, I don't know if it's like a cop out, like him saying like, well, you know, it's the gods yep. that make me do it, even though I might be just yeah. scared. It's every coward's excuse, and it's, it's the worst breakup excuse ever, you know? It wasn't, it wasn't meant to be. Right, um, but you're 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 right, Scott. I mean, I, I think it's a it's a really brilliant point that there is a there is a basic reading of this narrative that says that fleeing a city rather than staying and fighting uh, and saving yourself, even if you're saving your family too, doesn't look like piety. Um, but as we travel further in the, the book, we'll see that for Virgil it does for very particular reasons. But it's a it's a really perceptive point. And you're picking up on this tension here where. Um, it's a tension that Aeneas is probably aware of as he tells the story, because his listeners are doing what you're doing. You're going, mm, so the whole city burned down, and you're the only one that escaped just with a few other people, right? I mean, what happened here, right? There's, there are questions that are being raised, and Virgil is, is going to uh, uh, show a form of piety that may be a little bit counterintuitive, as we'll see. But again, I mean, the, the ultimate uh, breakup you know, bad breakup line or, or excuse for a coward is just, well, it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't in the stars. Or, you know, the gods had, had been created otherwise. In other words, he kind of blames it on the gods to take a team That's off one way of thinking about it. Yeah, you know, I had to go, right? Had to um, do it. Now, who is his protector? Who's the goddess who loves Aeneas? Who's driving him forward? We have Juno, similar to Hera, who's going to, to cause him all sorts of trouble. But who is his protector? Isn't his mother the it's one his that's mother. covering for him? Yeah, it's his mother, Venus, yeah. similar to Aphrodite. So remember, Aphrodite loved Paris. Uh, Aphrodite loves, uh, or, or Venus loves Aeneas. Why? Because Aeneas' father, Anchises, 
fathered him with a goddess. Okay, so she is, she is Aeneas's uh, mother. Now, of course, this is an interesting correspondence between Aeneas and Achilles to some extent, right? Because Achilles is uh, half, half human and half god, uh, Thetis and, and, and Peleus. Thetis is a, a nymph goddess and Peleus is a man. Uh, they they uh, have Achilles, so there's some correspondence there. Um, but what we're going to see, and again, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, Scott, but what we're going to see, especially when we get to the, the uh, point where Aeneas is going to leave Dido, is that he believes that his pietas means following the will of his mother, Venus. Okay? And that's what piety will look like for him, even though it probably doesn't to us. Probably shouldn't to us, but there you have it. Um, other thoughts? Let's, um, let's skip over. Um, Some of you will be very glad that we're doing this. We'll skip over book three and uh, jump to book four. Book three is a description of further journeys of Aeneas and his men. So he not only tells about the, the uh, fall of his city of Troy, but he also tells about some of the journeys that he and his men went on. Um, but let's, um, let's look at uh, book four and Dido's response to these stories. The queen, for her part, all that evening ached with longing that her heart's blood fed a wound or inward fire eating her away. The manhood of the man, his pride of birth, came home to her time and again. His looks, his words remained with her to haunt her mind, and desire for him gave her no rest. When dawn swept earth with Phoebus's torch and burned away night gloom and damp, this queen, far gone and ill, confided to the sister of her heart, my sister Anna, quandaries and dreams have come to frighten me. Such dreams. Think what a stranger yesterday found lodging in our house, how princely, how courageous, what a soldier. I can believe him in the line of gods, and this is no delusion. Okay, so she is smitten, she is in love uh, with Aeneas. Uh, book four is going to tell us a great deal about the relationship between Aeneas and uh, Dido. There are a number of passages which have been debated for close to, you know, I guess, more than 2,000 years, really since Virgil wrote the Aeneid. Um, and the debate is always around uh, whether what Aeneas and Dido had can properly be considered a marriage. There is at least one night that they spend together in a cave. Uh, and some people would say that is a marriage, others would not. Now, you know, if you're used to the sort of contemporary Book of Common Prayer style marriage with a pastor and all of that, I mean, no, it doesn't look like that. But Romans were very, very, um, uh, I guess we could say nonchalant when it comes to the formalities of marriage. It was a, a very nominal procedure uh, many times. It was often uh, built around property, and it could be uh, often ended as well under certain circumstances. Uh, so uh, the, the debates that rage in, in Virgilian scholarship is whether Virgil is depicting them as having been, been married, essentially. Okay? But we're going, to, we're going to pass over those debates and get to what I think is the uh, more uh, gripping uh, uh, passage in Book 4, uh, which concerns uh, the fact that... Um, uh, Aeneas is going to have to break the news to Dido that his mother, Venus, is compelling him to leave Carthage and to leave her. And this is going to be a, a pretty, um, uh, pretty brutal uh, breakup. So he um, uh, uh, spills the beans to her. He tells her this, and on page 108, her response to his statement is, is recorded starting in line 500. During all this, she had been watching him with face averted, looking him up and down in silence, and she burst out raging now. No goddess was your mother. Dardanus was not the founder of your family. Liar and cheat. Some rough Caucasian cliff begot you on flint. Hyrcanian tigresses tendered their teats to you. Why should I palter? Why still hold back for more indignity? Sigh. Did he, while I wept, or look at me, or yield a tear, or pity her who loved him? What shall I say first with so much to say? The time has passed when either supreme Juno or the Saturnian father viewed these things with justice. Faith can never be secure. I took the man in, thrown up on this coast in dire need, and in my madness then contrived a place for him in my domain, rescued his lost fleet, saved his shipmates' lives. 
Oh, I am swept away, burning by furies. Now the prophet Apollo, now his oracles, now the God's interpreter, if you please, sent down by Jove himself, brings through the air his formidable commands. All right, so she's not buying it. She doesn't, she doesn't get this excuse at all. Um, turn the page, top, uh, top of the page. Duty bound, Aeneas, though he struggled with desire to calm and comfort her in all her pain, to speak to her and turn her mind from grief, and though he sighed his heart out, shaken still with love of her, yet took the course heaven gave him and went back to the fleet. Now, Scott, to your question earlier, that for Virgil is pietas. Okay? It is leaving the woman that you love out of a sense of duty. Now, we should, we should um, pause here for, for a minute or two and just talk about this, this Roman sense of piety, because uh, I think it's an important part of the Aeneid, it's an important part of understanding Virgil. Um, the, the piety that a Roman man demonstrates is to look out for his household gods, to protect his wife and his children, and very importantly, to be loyal to Rome. That's it. It's not as kind of um, mushy-gushy as being a good dad. Um, Roman ideas of piety when it came to men would probably scandalize, I think, everyone in the room. I, I hope they would. A Roman man who shows piety is at his best when he is most detached from the, the parts of uh, life that would be seen as uh, a woman's work. So a Roman, a Roman father, for example, uh, rarely will know anything about his children until they've reached the age where they're likely to survive. Many, many, many infants and, and uh, young children would die at this point. Um, and a Roman man is often detached from that. Okay, so next time you read Cicero, and he writes these lovely contemplations about a man being detached uh, from suffering and keeping himself above the fray, part of the reason for that is because this is a man who's not changing poopy diapers. It's a man who's not in the fray. Um, that's for a woman. That's for his wife in this world. Um, it's very common, uh, we know from a number of sources, for men to wait a great deal of time before they get to know their, their child. And when they do, they are, their only concern is for uh, uh, a son, okay? A daughter is, is almost irrelevant. There's that um, really kind of terrifying correspondence between a, a Roman soldier and his wife that some of you may be familiar with, where the soldier writes home to his wife and says, uh, I have heard the, the news that you're expecting a child. Uh, if it is a girl, throw her out. If it's a boy, name her after me. Okay? Um, there was a whole practice of, of, of prostitution in Rome, largely driven by the fact that uh, female babies were often exposed. They were thrown out into the street. Um, a Roman man cares for his son. Uh, his son is named after him. Uh, so uh, Julius, if he has a son, you name him Julius. <laughs> Two sons, Julius, Julius, <laughs> uh, and so on. So if I had you know, two boys, they should be named Josh and Josh. Um, often you use mayor and minor, so there would be older and younger, greater and lesser. Um, but a Roman man is, is often detached from what are, what are seen as uh, uh, women's duties. Okay? So this pietas isn't the mushy-gushy being a good dad. Okay? This is serving Rome and having a son who will carry on your line. Um, does that make sense? Some of that is, is a bit scandalous to us, and I, I think it should be. Um, I, I think it's sure. interesting <clears throat> Please. that you see the same thing uh, you know, in the East has come to people's attention with reference to China <laughs> and the, 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 the male <laughs> sons. Um, and, I'm wondering, uh, are you familiar with, uh, uh, you know, other, like Africa, is there a sim similar thing, do you think? I don't really know. I don't, I don't really no, know. Because if it's in the West and it's in the East, yeah. that uh, aversion, yeah. shall we say, to the, to the daughter and mm -hmm. so forth, so. The daughter is, I, I don't know about those other contexts. In ancient Rome, the daughter is a, a great inconvenience to her father in many ways. One other thing, she requires a dowry when she gets married. That, that sort of thing is very inconvenient to a Roman father. But it's, it's 
it's more a function of just a very warlike culture in which a, a man has sons who give him glory and honor by fighting well like he fought. I mean, there's that, that just very strong sense of, of um, masculinity in this kind of culture. You had raised your hand earlier, and I'll yeah, come um, back to you. Back on line 545, mm -hmm. it says the word duty bound in Aeneas. Yeah, yeah. Is that closely related to the word mm -hmm. okay. I don't know what that is in Latin. I'd have to look that yeah. up in Latin, but yeah, yes. Because that's also back on page 17. He says, I am Aeneas, duty bound and known. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a thing yeah. that he keeps mentioning yeah. about himself. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how Fitzgerald translated the Latin there, but yeah. the notion of duty and the notion of piety are very closely linked okay. for, for Virgil, yeah. absolutely. So don't think of piety as, for, for a Roman necessarily, the, the same thing as like what we would think of as like being a good dad or being a good mom. It is uh, duty, uh, uh, being duty bound, being dutiful to one's, one's country, you know, in this case, one's city uh, of Rome, and to one's family, uh, most especially to the, the sons that you and your wife will have that will carry on your name. Um, these things are shocking to us, I think. I, I think there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an almost incomprehensible uh, carelessness about uh, human life among Romans and Greeks at times that, that just staggers us. Um, you, you think of, um, you think of a world in which uh, infant mortality would be incredibly high, and then you think of that same world where men are detached from that, uh, and you realize that there was very much a double standard for, for life in this world, where a man was able to be detached from that because he, he would not know that child. You know, that, that's, a, that's an incredible, um, I think sometimes an incredible contrast, especially to those of us who are you know, our fathers, who are engaged in that, you know, who think, what would I have missed if I had waited three years to be involved in my kids' lives, you know? But this, that's how that world was organized. Um, there's a really telling uh, uh, correspondence uh, between uh, a Greek-speaking man, but he's living during the, the uh, Roman Empire, um, about the year 120 AD, a man named Plutarch. Familiar with Plutarch? Uh, he captures some of this, both for Greeks and Romans. He write, both for Greeks and Romans. He writes a, a letter called a consolatio, a consolation. Uh, to his wife, because he's traveling and he finds out that his, he and his wife have lost uh, their daughter, who's about three years old. It's a beautiful letter, I recommend you read it sometime, especially if you're a parent, uh, because at times it's very touching. He talks about the fact that this daughter of theirs uh, was virtuous and he knew it because from her earliest years, he says, um, when the nurse would come to nurse her, you know, they would have a wet nurse to nurse her, he said that she would take her baby doll and ask for the baby doll to be nursed. Is that she was showing she was showing this this kindness? Um, he says to some extent it's good that she's died because something that good shouldn't have to live in a world as bad as ours. Um, but there are lines in there that are are striking to us as modern people and, and and quite offensive I think to our sensibilities. Where, for instance, he compliments his wife, who he says has shown very very little emotion, especially publicly. Um, and she's, she's born up so well that she is being considered by the neighbors almost as good as a man, okay? That's the world that we're talking about. It is a very masculine, uh, uh, very, you know, we would say in modern terms, very chauvinistic kind of, kind of context. And that's what we're dealing with. So don't take Pietas for, for Virgil and Aeneas and, you know, trans, you know, kind of transport that and pop that on top of what we think is piety. There are major differences. Uh, that have to be understood. Please. Um, with all that being yes. said, is Virgil trying to, like, so it's an origin story. Sure. So is Virgil trying to say, this is where the history of our piety comes from? Mm -hmm. Or is he trying to shape culture of the time to say, this is what piety should look like given where we come from? I think probably the second. I, okay. I mean, both. But he's, he's, he's preaching to an audience that, in his mind, needs to hear what the world needs are more men who are committed to doing their duty. I mean, this is an epic theme. I mean, this, this theme that goes back to Hector as well, that he does his duty. But for Virgil, that means loyalty to this, this city and doing one's duty you know, as it's dictated to him by the gods. So in some sense, it's propaganda. Sure. I mean, propaganda gets used a lot 
and, and sometimes it's not appropriate, I don't think it's probably unfair to think of the Aeneid as some kind of propaganda. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, it may be too strong a word, but something like propaganda, sure. It, yeah. Isn't Augustus mentioning the book? Like yes. His actual name. Yeah. It's like, We're going to see it in just a minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that strikes me more as yeah. a little bit more yeah. prideful. Yeah, yeah and, and propagandistic, yeah. Again, propaganda is a, a you know, loaded term, but something like that, sure. Yeah, I forget it's good book. that you see that. If one of the books in the Republic talks about what are we going to teach the guardians of the city as far as the art, the, the music they're going to yeah. teach them mm -hmm. to lead them. Mm -hmm. And so even Plato himself is like, you know, we need to mm -hmm. create myths to have, keep our guardians yeah. in check. And yeah. I think what this is exactly yeah. what Virgil's doing. Here. Yeah, uh, there, there, is a, there is a very strong be like Aeneas mm -hmm. uh, mentality, I think, that you can, you can pick up here quite a bit. Yeah. yeah kind of as a balance to the negative connotation of propaganda. Sure. Uh, I think it's, it's very common to say that the, you know, not only to the victors belong the spoil, mm -hmm. but to the victors belong the history. Sure. So the sure. victors always write the history. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know how they're yep. going to spin, yep. right? Yep. So I mean, it's just. A so let's pick up with that because I think that's a good segue back into this because we said yesterday that that Homer depicts uh, Trojan enemies of the Greeks in a very positive light many times, which is which is fascinating that he doesn't just have the good Greeks and the bad Trojans. You know, I'm a Greek, so I'm right. Well, look at look at um, how how Virgil portrays the founder of Carthage, one of the sworn enemies of Rome for hundreds of years. Um, uh, page 111, she continues to plead with Aeneas. Um, we see that um, uh, let me, I'm just looking for a good place to start. Um, look at uh, page five, or line 590, we'll start there. I, sh I sent no ship to Pergamum Neither did I uh, profane his father Anchises' dust and shade. Why will he not allow my prayers to fall on his unpitying ears? Where is he racing? Let him bestow one last gift on his mistress, this to await fair winds and easier flight. Now I no longer plead the bond he broke of our old marriage. There's that, that word that's debated as far as what their relationship was. Nor do I ask that he should live without his dear love Latium or yield his kingdom. Time is all I beg, mere time, a respite and a breathing space from for madness to subside and while my fortune teaches me how to take defeat and grieve. Pity your sister, this is the end, this favor, to be repaid with interest when I die. She pleaded in such terms and in, in, such, in such in tears, her sorrowing sister brought him time and again. Uh, but no tears moved him, no one's voice would he attend to traceably or tractably. The fates opposed it, God's will blocked the man's once kindly ears. And just as when the north winds from the Alps this way and that contend among themselves to tear away an oak tree hail with age, the wind and tree cry and the buffeted trunk showers high foliage to earth, but holds on bedrock, for the roots go down as far into the underworld as cresting boughs go up in heaven's air. Just so this captain, buffeted by a gale of pleas this way and that way, dinned all the day long, felt their moving power in his great heart, and yet his will stood fast, tears fell in vain. It's a really long but compelling uh, uh, simile there for um, Aeneas standing like a giant oak tree against the wind. Her tears do not uh, persuade him. So Aeneas uh, boards his ship and uh, uh, sails dutifully to the Italian um, uh, coast to follow his fate and to found Rome. And Dido responds uh, with a very heroic gesture. Um, page 119, she has a pyre prepared and she takes a sword onto the pyre. And 890, line 898, she climbed the pyre and bared the Darden sword, a gift desired once for no, for no such need. Her eyes now on the Trojan clothing there in the familiar bed, she paused a little, weeping a little, mindful, then lay down and spoke her last words. What has she made the pyre out of, by the way? His clothes, okay, the clothes that he's left. It's a, a really odd but 
gripping gesture. Remnants dear to me, while God and fate allowed it, take this breath and give me respite from these agonies. I lived my life out to the very end and past the stages fortune had appointed. Now my tall shade goes to the underworld. I built a famous town, saw my great walls, avenged my husband, made my hostile brother pay for his crime. Happy, alas, too happy, if only the Dardanian keels had never beached our coast. And here she kissed the bed. I die unavenged, she said, but let me die this way, this way, a blessed relief to go into the undergloom. Let the cold Trojan far at sea drink in this conflagration and take with him the omen of my death. Amid these words, her household people saw her crumpled over the steel blade, and the blade, aflush with red blood, drenched her hands. A scream pierced the high chambers. Now through the shocked city, rumor went rioting as wails and sobs with women's outcry echoed in the palace, and heaven's high air gave back the beating din, as though all Carthage or old Tyre fell to storming enemies, and out of hand flames billowed on the roofs of men and gods. Her sister heard and trembling, faint with terror, lacerating her face, beating her breast, ran through the crowd to call the dying queen. Now she had climbed the topmost steps, next page, line 20, uh, or page 121, uh, talking about the sister Anna. Now she had climbed the topmost steps and took her dying sister into her arms to cherish with a sob, using her dress to staunch the dark blood flow. But Dido, trying to lift her heavy eyes, fainted again. Her chest wound whistled air. That's a vivid description of a sword wound, that it whistled air. Three times she struggled up on one elbow, and each time fell back on the bed. Her gaze went wavering as she looked for heaven's light and groaned at finding it. Almighty Juno, filled with pity for this long ordeal and difficult passage, now sent Iris down out of Olympus to set free the wrestling spirit from the body's hold. For since she died, not at her fated span, nor as she merited it, but before her time, inflamed and driven rat, mad, Proserpina had not yet plucked from her the golden hair, delivering her to Orcus of the Styx. So humid iris brought bright heaven flu on saffron yellow wings, and in her train a thousand hues shimmered before the sun. At Dido's head she came to rest. This token sacred to Dis, I bear away as bidden and free you from your body. Saying this, she cut a lock of hair. Along with it, her body's warmth fell into dissolution, and out into the winds her what life withdrew. Now turn the page and keep reading. Cutting through the waves, blown dark by a chill wind, Aeneas held his ships firmly on course for a mid-sea crossing. But he kept his eyes upon the city far astern, now bright with poor Alyssa's pyre. What caused that blaze remained unknown to watchers out at sea, but what they knew of a great love profaned in anguish and a desperate woman's nerve led every Trojan heart into foreboding. It's brilliant, isn't it? She kills herself, her sister uh, dies along with her on the pyre, and Aeneas, okay? blown dark by a chill wind, held his ships firmly on course. But he's looking back, and they're seeing the flames from a funeral pyre. And he doesn't know what caused the flames, but he knows that there was unrequited love. You get that? Um, so it's a, it's a really powerful um, uh, description of the, the uh, um, pietas, which requires Aeneas to not only leave the city of Troy as it is burning, but to leave this woman that he has entered into a relationship with, perhaps a marriage, but a very close relationship with, um, in order to fulfill his duty. What do you think of Aeneas on that? Is he a, is he a loser? <laughs> I, I, I've taught this in enough uh, context that sometimes people have really strong opinions and sometimes they don't care. So any, any feelings one way or the other? What do you think, Jose? I mean, compared to Hector, he's just, he's not my type of hero. <laughs> he's, not, yeah, he's not your type of hero, right? Well, I mean, I guess he's more conflicted, so I kind of like that, but I, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, so maybe as a story, it's a little bit more complex. Yeah. He's, it, he's more nuanced as a character. But yeah. Don't maybe he brings a little bit more humanity uh -huh. than maybe Homer might have, uh -huh. in, that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not, he's not, I don't know, I feel like we're just maybe trying to, like, make him... There is, a long, there is a long history of Roman literature, and if you think of Livy, uh, the Roman historian Livy, I'll just put his name up on the board. Does this name sound familiar to all of you? Uh, the Roman historian Livy, he wrote uh, many books of history of Rome. Uh, um, he's the one I mentioned to you that talked about history being the best medicine for sick minds. Um, over and over. For the sick mind? Uh, medicine for a sick oh, yeah. mind. Um, over and over, Livy in his histories will tell stories like, here is a Roman soldier who goes into single combat and defeats 
the man who is betrothed to his sister. The sister, when he defeats this man and kills him, starts to cry, and the woman kills her. It says, this is what happens to all the, those who would favor Rome's enemies. Mm -hmm. He's a hero. Mm -hmm. He's prosecuted, but the father comes into the court and tells the court, my son is a hero. He was killing one of the, one of the sympathizers of, of Rome's enemies. I mean, this sense that you, you must put your city and your duty to your city and to the, the gods over <coughs> your duties to those that you love yeah. is a really profound and important one for, I think, for Virgil and for other um, people who are writing at this period who are, trying to, um, who are trying to create a period of peace and prosperity in Rome. And what that requires is people who are loyal to Rome, you know? Uh, but it has it has harsh edges to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Very problematic at points. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with me, but is he looking more like a god than than, than, than a hero? Because yes, we talked about how Zeus again he's like you know he'll do something and then do something completely different. Mm -hmm. and they're jumping back mm -hmm. and forth, and in a way he's doing the same. He's like. Mm -hmm. You know whether he's married or not, but you know he's with this woman and then yeah. he's not with this woman, yeah. and is 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 I guess because he's following the gods, is he more godlike in that sense? Yeah, I mean, there's there's one way of reading Aeneas, and it's probably a fair reading of him that uh, the rules don't apply to him, and he has this attitude that you know while others might be required to do such and such, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting insight then into Roman history. You know, is that is Virgil saying that that's what Rome has done? Is Rome is Virgil saying that's what Rome needs? Um, one of the things that I hope that everyone is seeing, both in this work and, and already in the Iliad, is how open to multiple interpretation many of these narratives are. And I I I hope that you're seeing that. I'm giving you one take on these passages. I'm giving you one read on these characters. I, have done this for many years, I'm happy to do that. But at the same time, I want to leave it open if you have points where you, you dissent from that, that, that's also fine. Um, yeah? I would say, you know, does he show in Pietas? And I think he is, but also at the same time, if he's going to show even more Pietas, he wouldn't have entangled himself with Dino in the first place. Right, <laughs> right. Because yeah. he's straightforward, he's trying yeah. to have his cake and eat it yeah. too, you know, yeah. in that sense. And I think he's just going to leave pieces mm -hmm. of that behind him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The truly pious man doesn't get entangled to begin with, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this really sheds light on the difficulties that we have today relating uh, the contemporary West to Islam. Hmm. Uh, you see, with honored killings, for example, where duty to family and shame to the family and so forth and so on is such even to this day and age you have fathers and brothers killing. So on that topic when it comes to honor killings um, Dido is the one of, one of these examples of a woman who has been mistreated who demonstrates her honor and her virtue in that process by killing herself. She's not the first in Roman history. I mentioned that there was a woman named Lucretia who had been raped, who demonstrated her virtue by killing herself. Um, this is one of the things that the Christian theologian Augustine will, will end up taking great issue with. Um, he writes, uh, as I mentioned, that early on when he was a boy that he loved the Aeneid, that he even wept. Well, he wept with Dido, he says, when he, when he read about Dido. Later on in his life, though, when the city of this Rome... Is, this is Augustine you're yes, talking about yes, now, right? Yeah. Yes. Later on um, in, in his life, though, when the city of Rome was captured by the Goths in 410, Augustine set out to write his magnum opus of sorts, The City of God. One of the topics he has to deal with is women who have been raped by Goths. And he makes a really interesting argument against this Roman tradition of Lucretia and, and Dido that a woman is not required to in any way prove her virtue by taking her life that that is in fact the wrong thing to do. It's a really interesting argument. It's often overlooked in, in people who read Augustine on City of God. But he argues that a woman's honor is not something that needs to be um, defended with that kind of action, that that's actually wicked. Uh, so, yeah. <coughs> when Jesus says, says uh, forsake all, sell everything, leave your family, yep. is he kind of 
because I, I mean he's he's talking to Jews who are under the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. but he's kind of is he? I'm not saying he's necessarily alluding to, but does that go with the thought of the Romans more than it goes with the thoughts of the Jews? I don't know. What do you think? I mean, according to what we were talking about, mm -hmm. of you know duty uh, and leaving family behind, mm -hmm. could he be a little bit more? understanding of that in that sense yes yeah. i mean it may it may be stated in that kind of context and i have to go back and look at that that's a, it's an interesting question i mean certainly christ is calling people to uh follow him and if that means that it's at the expense of uh you know family then that that's still what's required um i don't know how much of a comparison there is between the two i'd have to think about it but it's a good it's a good it's good that you're thinking about that it's interesting yeah. think about it i i think that this, the idea of duty is, as far as all cultures have that. Sure. They're just different. Yeah. So Jesus is going to be using the idea of duty just as Jews would have uh, a sense of duty. Mm -hmm. So do Romans. So do all other cultures. So I think this idea of piety or duty, um, yeah, that all, all cultures have this. It's a form of ethics. Mm -hmm. Just what is right. What should you do be above everything else? Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus talks about that. So I'm not sure if it's it's related to Roman culture. It's just related to every uh, part of human. Other thoughts on on any of that? We're gonna we'll see if we can finish by lunch. Well, that, that's an ambitious task, but that's the goal. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> Is that a fool's errand? Do it, man. Yeah. <laughs> we could try. Uh, we will be done at, by, by 12 at the very latest for lunch. So um, let's see if we can uh, uh, let's see if we can finish the Aeneid. We'll, we'll at least give it a old college try. Um, book six, which I asked you to read, uh, concerns um, Aeneas's descent into the underworld. This is a really common story in the ancient world. A hero who goes into the underworld. Hercules does it, right? Orpheus does it. Uh, this is a, a common story. Um, I'll, I'll uh, come right out and say that if, if that reminds you, for instance, of Christ descending into the underworld, I mean, there's probably a reason for that. I mean, that is a, that is a common motif at the time. Um, and, and Christ uh, doing that uh, is, is in, in some sense, probably setting himself up as the true Hercules, the true Orpheus, and so on. Um, but here, um, here we find Aeneas going down into the underworld. Um, just due to time constraints, we won't do a great deal to set up his journey into the underworld, and I'll, I'll, I'll instead just show you some key passages um, of people that he, he finds in the underworld. Uh, one of the people that he finds is going to be his father, and we'll see that Anchises is going to die uh, and go into the underworld, and, and Aeneas will go down to see him. Uh, but he'll also see Dido. Let's look at, at his, his encounter with Dido in the underworld. It's a kind of interesting one. Um, page 175 in book six, we're at line 607. Um, I'll give you a minute to find it. Phoenician Dido wandered the deep wood. The Trojan captain paused nearby and knew her dim form in the dark as one who sees early in the month or thinks to have seen the moon rising through cloud all dim. He wept and spoke tenderly to her. Dido, so forlorn, the story then that came to me was true, that you were out of life, had met your sad end by your own hand. Was I? Was I the cause? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. This is great. <laughs> I swear by heaven's stars, by the high gods, by any certainty below the earth. Um, I left your land against my will, my queen. The gods' commands drove me to do their will, as now they drive me through this world of shades, these moldy wastelands and these depths of night. And I could not believe that I would hurt you so terribly by going. Wait a little. Do not leave my sight. Am I someone to flee from? The last word destiny lets me say to you is this. Aeneas, with such pleas, tried to placate the burning soul savagely glaring back, and tears came to his eyes. But she had turned with gaze fixed on the ground as he spoke on, her face no more affected 
than if she were immobile granite or Marpesian stone. At length she flung away from him and fled, his enemy still into the shadowy grove, where he whose bride she once had been. Sychaeus joined in her sorrows and returned her love, that's her husband who was killed by Pygmalion. Aeneas still gazed after her in tears, shaken by her ill fate and pitying her. That's a great passage, isn't it? Um, many, many years later, um, when uh, the poet Dante writes his Divine Comedy, and he travels uh, as the pilgrim Dante uh, through hell, a story that we'll read when we do the comedy class, we'll read the Divine Comedy in that. Um, when he travels through hell, his guide is Virgil. And it's because, in part, he loved Virgil, and it's because, in part, Virgil does such a good job of talking about Aeneas going through the underworld. And there are many correspondences that we'll uh, pick up on when we get to the comic class. Um, let's look at Aeneas's uh, encounter with his father. So book six, uh, sorry, book six, uh, line uh, 931. Was there a page? Yes, so it's page 186. I have trouble sometimes because I dog ear pages to find them and then it often covers the page number for myself, so sorry about that. So yeah, sorry, 184, um, line 931. So 184, line 931. Aeneas says to his father, Aeneas said, your ghost, your sad ghost father, often before my mind impelled me to the threshold of this place. My ships ride anchored in the Tuscan Sea but let me have your hand, let me embrace you, do not draw back. At this his tears brimmed over and down his cheeks, and there he tried three times to throw his arms around his father's neck. Three times the shade untouched slipped through his hands, weightless as wind and fugitive as dream. Aeneas now saw at the valley's end a grove standing apart with stems and boughs of woodland rustling in the stream of Letha running past these peaceful glades. Around it, souls of a thousand nations filled the air as bees and meadows at the height of summer there's that metaphor again, bees in summer, uh, hover in home on flowers and thickly swarm on snow light willies and the countryside is loud with humming. Um, so what I want you to see there in, in terms of that passage is the recurrence of this theme that a ghost would seek to embrace three times. You remember that when he found Crucia after she was, she was dead, when she appears to him, there's that attempted embrace three times. I'm not exactly sure what that means, why it's three other than it's, it's demonstrating that there's a disconnect between the living and the dead, that the dead cannot, cannot actually physically embrace um, the living. Let's look uh, at one of the things that Aeneas is going to see uh, uh, that is going to be prophesied to him at the guidance of his father. Um, well, there's, there's a very long prophecy here, but we're going to cut to the, the central part of it, which is going to be the part that Thick Scott referenced as propaganda, which is probably a, a fair, a fair kind of description for this sort of thing. A very close to fair. Um, page 187, uh, at the bottom of the page, line uh, 1068. Turn your two eyes this way and see this people, your own Romans. Here is Caesar and all the line of Eulus, all who should wa shall one day pass under the dome of the great sky. This is the man, this one of whom so often you have heard the promise, Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. I'll keep reading this, but who is Caesar? He is a member of the Julian line, okay? The Julian line goes back, Virgil wants you to believe, to Eulus. So this prophecy, is saying to Aeneas that your son, Eulus, will have a line and his descendants will culminate in the greatest <laughs> Roman ever, a man who's part of the Julian line, the Julian line, Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. He will extend his power beyond the Garaments and Indians, over far territories, north and south, of the zodiacal stars, the solar way, where Atlas, heaven-bearing on his shoulder, turns the night sphere, studded with burning stars. At that man's coming, even now, the realms of Caspia and Meotia tremble, warned by oracles, and the seven mouths of Nile go dark with fear. The truth is, even Alcides never traversed so much of earth. I grant that he could shoot the hind with brazen hoofs, or bring peace to the groves of Aramith, 
uh, sorry, Arimanthus, or leave Lerna affrighted by his bow. Neither did he who guides his triumphal car, or chariot, with reins of vine shoots twisted, Bacchus driving down from Nyssa's height his tiger team. Do we lag still at carrying our valor into action? Can our fear prevent our settling in Asonia? There's more, but in essence what you have now is a prophecy made to Aeneas that his son will found a line that will result in the peace of Rome. Caesar Augustus, a member of the Julian house. Now, Christians loved Virgil. Uh, one of the reasons, as I mentioned, that uh, Dante uh, uh, uses Virgil as his guide through hell is that Virgil was one of the most popular of the so-called pagan poets. Why do you think that Christians love Virgil so much? Augustine, for instance, loved Virgil, especially in his youth. Why do they love Virgil so much as Christians? Can you compare this to Christian prophecy, David? Jesus? Perhaps, yeah, yeah. Uh, a number of early Christians see in Virgil uh, prophecies like this. And you can find other uh, prophecies in Virgil's writings as well, one of his eclogues in particular that prophesies a time when there will be a child born who will bring about peace and prosperity to the entire world. Christians, early on especially, believed that what Virgil was doing was unintentionally prophesying, not about a Caesar, but about Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so Virgil becomes very, very popular to early Christians for prophecies that are interpreted as actual prophecies about Christ. Now, did Virgil have that in his mind? There's no way. Um, but Christians will see him as essentially an, essentially an unintentional prophet. Um, he's very popular. He's, he's um, like I said, uh, important to Dante, among others. I think that might be the best place to stop. I, I think if we try to, to finish the whole book, we're going to be rushing a bit too much. So we'll, we'll stop a little bit early um, with just the... the I'll open it up for you know, the next two or three minutes. If anyone has any final thoughts or comments, we can have those and then we'll bring our conversation to an end. We'll pick up with the end of the Aeneid when we come back after lunch and then jump into, the, into Beowulf. So final thoughts or comments, now's your chance for can, lunch. Are we gonna talk about um, later on, maybe Thursday or Friday, are we gonna talk about maybe our, the myth that we have, maybe even as Americans, hmm. but also as Christians? Because I wonder, it seems that these myths are actually prescriptive about they're wanting their people to actually form or carry on a certain sense of duty. I mean, yeah. if we talk about it as propaganda, sure. they're actually wanting them, telling them this myth, they want them to act a certain way. Yeah. And I think that if we find just, yeah, are we going to talk about that? We can. Okay. I, I'm, I'm happy to. Probably hold off until the end of Thursday or, or early Friday. And then once we've traveled through all this, that would be an interesting point in the wrap up. Because um, I, I think the kind of thing you're gesturing toward is uh, stories that we tell about our origins that are also very, um, uh, very much set out to govern our conduct now. You know, So if you think of um, uh, certain uh, schools of thought that would say that like every founding father of America was a Christian, you know, a good evangelical Baptist Christian, and therefore we should also be good. I mean, that sort of thing would be like that. Or every founding father was a good modern uh, left-wing liberal, and therefore we should all be, you know what I mean? There are, there are stories that can be told that kind of capture not just this is where we came from, but this is what we should be doing. I think that's, that's fine, especially towards the end if you want to use that when we're wrapping up. Other, yeah. Towards that, yep. and just as making sure I'm tracking, sure. Like Virgil was commissioned by Caesar to write this. Mm. So in some the extent sense, to which it was formalized is not clear, but yeah, essentially he's writing it for. So then yeah. this prophecy about the sun to come from yeah. 1200 BC to yeah. now is yeah. also just because I'm keeping it clear. Yeah. he's paid to say this. So yeah. now history is being written by yeah. Caesar, the first citizen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Jim made this point, you know, that, that uh, to, to the victor goes the spoils, but there's a sense yeah. in which history is also written by the, the victors, and this is a, a Roman history of, uh, this is a, a state-sanctioned, uh, a at least, history of Rome. 
you know, so you're, you're going to expect that it's going to kind of fall under, right. fall on certain lines. Absolutely. Any final thoughts before we break? Or along that way, <coughs> sure. um, back during the um, uh, Goldwater time yep. when he mm -hmm. ran for president yep. and so forth, <coughs> there was a very popular uh, book that was published um, entitled uh, None Dare Call It Treason. Which <clears throat> was a play, I think it's on Shakespeare, okay. that said uh, treason never su succeeds because if it succeed, none dare call it treason. Ah, interesting. You, you understand yeah, I do. I do. And I, I think that is a, a classic example of what yeah. we're yeah. what we're talking about here. Yeah. If, if you know the victor is the one that is. That succeeds, and the victor is the one who then tells the tale and yeah. writes the story. Had Octavian, for instance, uh, and his forces lost at the Battle of Actium, there'd be a very different story about. Uh, in, a very, in a very different world. Sure. Yep. Because it may very well have wrapped. Uh, I mean, part of what got Mark Anthony, I understand, in trouble is that it seemed like he was shifting the emphasis from Rome to Egypt, to Alexandria, and yep. so the whole culture would have yep. wrapped around uh, hmm. Alexandria. Hmm. Last comment. Okay, I was just going to say, with I appreciate so much how he tells the story between uh, when uh, Aeneas comes and sees Dido, and he's like, Is, did I do something wrong? <laughs> was it me? And it's just like this, it's a, this savage staring back at him, you know, I'm like, man, that is such a true to life yeah. image of, yeah. you know, a man saying, oh, did I, was it me? And she just like stare back at him yeah. like, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to say, because you know, or, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> no, you, you should know yeah. now by at least. Yeah. I just, I was like, man, that is, that's amazing. You see that even back here. Yeah. It, you know, the, the, there are constants to human nature yeah. that Epic uh, picks up on. Um, you know, that that uh, new news is old news happening to new people, that kind of thing. That you know, there's something that's centrally the same about all of us. And I think one of the reasons that an epic like the Aeneid sticks around for so long is just like the Iliad. There are moments in it where you just see basic uh, perceptiveness about human character. And, and that perceptiveness into the into human character remains perceptive 2,000 years later. It's what we are too. Yeah. You know? um, so great, great comment there. Let's uh, bring it to a close until we come back for, for uh, ap after lunch. We'll come back at 1.30 if that's okay. So you've got an hour and a half and uh, we'll pick up with the Aeneid and we'll try to cover Beowulf this afternoon as well. So see you in a bit.